Morning, members. I'm going to take us live so that we can start the meeting. I know that Councillor Heather Williams is in the building, um, but we can do this sort of introductory conference everything as we're after 10 o'clock so that she can come in and join us. Gosh, we feel kind of really together here as well. Okay, yeah, we're live? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, sorry, I was waiting until we were live. So, good morning, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the streaming of this meeting, and welcome to the Planning Committee of South Cam's District Council. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'm chair of this committee. Please, can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. The camera follows the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are requested to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up so that those viewing can, can see us all. And please, can those participating in the meeting via the live stream, good morning, indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column, and please do not use the chat column for any other purpose apart from asking to speak. Um, my chair will be managing um, the order for speakers, my vice chair. Make sure your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you're invited to do otherwise. Um, and please ensure you've switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they don't interrupt proceedings. Um, as requested yesterday by email, please use a headset if available when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on um, and your video, and when you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Speak slowly and clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. And at this moment, if I could ask that all those who are um, taking part in the virtually to turn off their video, please, as well as their microphone. Thanks so much. Please note if we need to vote on any item, we shall do so via the microphones here in the room. Only those present in the chamber can vote or propose or second recommendations. So, committee members, hello, good morning. Hello. <laughs> and I'll now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. After I call your name, um, turn your microphone, wait two seconds and say your name so that your presence may be noted. So, as I said earlier, my name is Councillor Pippa Halings, member for Histon and Beaton and Orchard Park, and I'm the chair, my vice chair. Morning, Councillor Henry Batchelor, one of the members for Linton and Vice Chair of the Committee. Thank you. Um, Councillor Martin Khan. Hello, Councillor Martin Khan, uh, one of the members for Houston, Linton and Orchard, uh, Orchard Park. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr Claire Daunton. Um, thank you. I'm um, Claire Daunton and I'm one of the members for the Fenderton and Fullbourne Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Peter Payne. Morning, Peter Payne, Shelford Ward. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yeah, Councillor Jeff Harvey and the member for Portion Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Jimmy Hawkins. Good morning, everyone. Timmy Hawkins, Caldicott Ward. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Heather Williams and I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Uh, good morning, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I represent the Whittlesford Ward. Thank you. And Councillor Eileen Wilson. Good morning, um, Councillor Eileen Wilson, and I represent Cottenham and Rampton Ward. Thank you. Are there any other members present? I don't see anybody. Good, and I can confirm that the meeting is for it. And we also have two officers in the chamber. Chris Parker. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. And Chris is the delivery manager for strategic sites, and Stephen Reed. I 
I won't say happily, he's not Asian. <laughs> Oh, well, so we have, do have with us Stephen Reed, who is our senior planning lawyer. Um, if any time a member leaves the meeting, would they please make the fact known to me so that it can be recorded in the minutes? Thank you. And I intend breaking for 15 minutes approximately every hour as we're in a room that's poorly ventilated, but we have both doors open, as you know. Um, and so I'll now go to the agenda item number two, apologies. Um, Ian, do we have any apologies for today? Yes, Chair, we have uh, two. We have uh, apologies from Councillor Judith Rippert and Councillor Deborah Roberts and Councillor Dr Claire Daunton, as you know, is here. She's substitute for Councillor Rippert. Thank you very much. Um, any other apologies? No. And agenda item three, declarations of interest. Do any members have any interest to declare in relation to any items of business on this agenda? If an item um, or an interest subject becomes apparent later in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point? I see Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Agenda item seven, which is the uh, item in Caldicott, um, District Council, I'm also a parish councillor and have been in on meetings where it was discussed. But I come to the matter afresh. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you, Chair. Item number five. Um, I have um, a pecuniary interest in this item as my employer has an ongoing business relationship with the applicant. So, under legal advice, I won't be taking any part in the debate and vote, and I'll be leaving the room when it's discussed. Thank you. And Councillor Peter Fain, could I ask you at that point to act as my vice chair for that item when we come to it? Is that okay? Would do committee members? Take that by affirmation. Thank you very much. Good. Um, members, we come to agenda item number four, the minutes. And, yes, you're right there. Yeah, sorry. Just chair, but it just says yeah. to note that we don't have anything to vote on. It'll be presented to the committee meeting on the 11th of August. Yeah, thank you very much. And agenda item five. Now, there's just, before we move on to the substantive report, um, I would just like to invite Chris Carter to address one of the issues that's come to our attention. Thank you, Chair. Yes, good morning, members. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of an email received by members last night from Mr. Fulton of the Hughes Lane Consortium, uh, raising concerns about access to documents and information prior to the committee meeting today. Um, whilst ultimately this will be a matter for the committee to uh, determine whether or not it's happy to proceed, uh, I would just set out the following um, information for your consideration. Uh, with regard to the uh, application at Water Beach, uh, the application was received on the 21st of May 2021 and consultation expired on the 17th of June 2021. With regard to the application at TOF, this application was valid from the 20th of August 2020. Consultation expired, the final round of consultation expired on the 26th of February 2021. And with regard to the item at Comberton, no public consultation took place as this is an application for a certificate of lawfulness. Uh, the Parish Council were notified and did comment. Uh, all of those applications, therefore, have been uh, available publicly for some time. Um, Mr. Fulton did contact officers of the Council on Thursday last week, raising concerns with regard to access to information due to the recapture software, which the Council uses to keep its uh, network secure. Uh, special arrangements were put in place on Friday last week where recapture was turned off for a period of two hours so that Mr. Fulton could download any documents he wished to view. Uh, it was then turned on again after that uh, two hours had expired. Uh, there was no suggestion from Mr. Fulton or the consortium after that period that he had been unable to access the documents he wished to view uh, or that more time was required or a request for any specific documents to be sent directly. Uh, no other party um, has suggested that they've been un unable to access uh, documents related to these applications uh, and no comments have been received on these items during the consultation period from either Mr. Fulton directly or from the Hughes Lane Consortium. Uh, there is, of course, given the history um, of challenges from Hughes Lane Consortium, a risk that they may seek to challenge any subsequent decision uh, on these applications. 
but it's the view of officers that there's been sufficient time and access to these applications for any representation to be made, particularly having regard to the special arrangements which were put in place at the end of last week. Um, notwithstanding all of this, if further representations were made following the committee today, um, there would be an opportunity to consider whether or not an application should, should be referred back to the committee, uh, should any new issues that weren't considered today be raised. So the advice of officers is that uh, the committee is able to determine these applications today, but I think, Chair, that's a matter for you and your fellow committee members to determine. Thank you. Thank you. So, committee, it's up to us, um, members, to um, determine this and to go to a vote. I'd just like to ask for legal clarification in terms of representation. So, as I understand it, we have a community statement that, that tells us how comments and representations can be made. Can you clarify um, that comments can be made following a committee determination as well? Yes, Chair. Um, the Council has a statement of community involvement which says specifically that late representations uh, will be considered. Uh, if those come forward, officers will have the opportunity to consider whether they give rise to new material considerations and to uh, advise whether they feel that they are sufficient to justify the matter coming back to the committee. Thank you, members. So I'll go to any comments or questions of that before moving to a vote to determine whether we continue with the determination of the issues on the agenda. Thank you. Councillor Haberlin. Thank you, Chair. Oh, I see you've got your nameplate changed. Um, so I, I do have a question to say, has this issue been resolved and is it still, still an issue? So if we could have, a, I think it would be beneficial to have an update on the problems and, and whether we've got resolution on them. Um, because I know on other applications I've had residents get in touch that they've not been able to access. So, um, yeah, has that been resolved now? I think we are being put in a very difficult position, again, through a, a technical, um, I don't know, I'm not an IT expert, I hold my hands up but some sort of IT issue. This isn't the first time. Um, I, I appreciate what's been said about the fact that it could come back if it's deemed material. But ultimately, as councillors, we don't make that decision. So if we're to determine the application today on that provision, you know, we would need absolutely 100% concrete if there's anything else that comes in, it comes back to us. And the reality is, because of the way our scheme of delegation is, we cannot have that assurance because it's not in our decision. So it's not in our power anymore. So while, you know, I've probably travelled one of the furthest to get here today, I'm, I don't think I'm entirely comfortable determining things with, as it currently stands, um, and I'll, I really would like to know, has this been sorted? Because it, it can't carry on. Good, thank you. So we can ask that question of the office if it's been resolved. Nevertheless, no matter what the response is, we still have to make a decision about what's going on, but it would be good to know where the situation is in that case. Thank you, Chair. Yes, so the recapture software, just uh, for your awareness, is, is something that's used nationwide um, uh, in order to stop, essentially, the mining, sweeping mining of data. Uh, so it's a, it's a piece of software that I understand Google have produced that's, that's commonly used um, by uh, councils and, and businesses. Uh, in terms of uh, an update to it, there is a plan, I understand, uh, either later today or tomorrow to uh, launch a new piece of software, which is approved by iDocs, who are the company who maintain the planning database for us. They're the, one of the biggest providers in the country, uh, with a view to trying to reduce the number of issues such as this that have been raised. Um, but uh, so there is a further update coming, uh, is my understanding. Thank you. And have Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawke. Sorry, Dr. Tumi. Can I have an idea of time scales, please? My understanding is within the next 24, 48 hours that update will be in place. Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawke. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, this council will be failing in its responsibility if it didn't look after its um, 
its assets, especially its data. We did have a bot attack, which is why the captured software was installed. Um, and it seems to me that um, the, the, the access to the data that's been requested um, seems to be a problem for just one person. I have looked at the data, um, I think of the files, I've been able to access the files this morning. I, no one else has complained or been unable to access the files. Um, this, the, the, the files have been in the public domain for beyond, as we've heard. Um, it seems to me that leaving this till late is another ploy uh, to put us in a difficult situation. I believe that we have done everything that we possibly can, uh, given the circumstances, to enable uh, Mr. Fulton to get access to the data that he is after. But we must make sure that we do our duty, which is to determine applications that we're here to do um, today. So I will be voting for us to actually carry on with this. Thank you. Okay, committee, I'm going to put this to the vote. I think also, not. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yes, Dr. Martin Kerr. <clears throat> I simply wanted to comment that uh, for having access to uh, applications over the computer is a relatively modern invention. Uh, when I was working in the planning department uh, 30 years ago, uh, you had access by coming to the planning department and looking at the application, and that was considered legal then. Um, the, Mr. Fulton was given, when he complained, was given access to uh, applications and was able to access them, so, which is equivalent to the situation it was before. So it doesn't seem to me that actually he was prevented from access or any other applicant, if they had problems, was prevented from access. It's, it's, it's equivalent to the situation before the introduction of computing, uh, computing access over the internet, and therefore I don't see any reason why we should uh, not determine the application. Um, thank you, and, and I understand uh, the issues of access and the quality of access in terms of opportunity. We, we want to make it as possible and easy for everybody to access things. I think we want to honour the statement of commitment, you know, to community, um, our statement of community involvement, representation and participation. Um, I think on this, as um, you know, for myself, as Dr. Jimmy Hawkins has said, you know, we have a responsibility as an, and a duty um, to get the assets, which is why the software is going in. We've understood that this has caused problems to one application, one person, which is Mr. Fulton. Um, and I'm sure if there are late representations, that has been done before um, by Mr. Fulton, it will be allowed. Um, this is my view. I think we would need to go to the vote now to determine whether or not, as, as committee, we can proceed to, to determine the applications on the agenda. Here, Dr. Richard Williams. A small comment, Chair, I don't want to delay things, but I just want to say I'm, I'm pleased to hear that the, the software is being looked at because I know that has been a problem for residents. I, I know this, this case is a pretty extreme case, but I have had cases. In fact, I've had a problem myself accessing some things. So I'm pleased to hear that it's being addressed. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. So members will take it to the vote, please, which is to that we as a committee, um, what would be the vote? What would be the move? Yeah, continue to determine the applications um, that we have before us today. So if you're in favor um, or against, please let me know that. Yeah. One more we need. Thank you, members. So with nine votes in favor and one against and no abstentions, um, that has passed and we will continue with the agenda as before us and determine the applications before us. So that means that we move to substantive item number five um, on page one of your agenda pack. Thank you, sir. So, um, Councillor Henry Batchelor, as Vice Chair, will withdraw from this agenda item and leave the room. Um, and I'd ask Councillor Peter Fain to. Yes, please, then you can sit there. If, if there's anybody virtually. Yeah. 
So I was sorry, everybody. I was just double checking that Councillor Peter Fain also could access um, the chat. So if any of the members virtually who are taking part, so Aaron's going to help you with that. Thank you. So we are on page one of the agenda pack. This is for Water Beach New Town, application number 21 slash 02400 slash reserved matters. And this is a reserved matters application for 89 dwellings for appearance, means of access, landscaping, layout and scale pursuant to condition three of the outline planning permission, S slash 0559 slash 17 slash outline permission. The applicant is Stonebond. The recommendation from officers is approval subject to the conditions. And the key material considerations for us today are the principle of development and design code compliance. Um, it's not a departure, and I'll just confirm, it's not a departure. <laughs> That's um, this has been brought to the committee to allow consideration of parish council objection and because this is the first reserved matters application for housing at the new town, and we really want to ensure that we understand um, the standards um, that are being you know, held as we move through the, the build out of, of this strategic new town. And the presenting officer is Mike. Hello, Chair. I'm remote. <laughs> You're remote. <laughs> I'm actually in the office, but I'm remote. <laughs> Do you have a video, Develop. Mike? Nope. Hello, Chair. Hello. Good morning. Nice to see you. And do you want us to take to any updates into a summary of the application as well? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. I think Mr. Carter was going to update members from a late rep from the Parish Council. So we'll do that when we get to the parish council um, points. Or do you want to speak to it? I, th I thought I thought that was going to be the first I the first thing that was going to be. Okay, thank you very much. Read out. If that's then okay. you can respond in the update. That's okay. And yeah. then, then I'll update members. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so this is a representation from Water Beach Parish Council uh, received on the twenty sixth of July. Uh, which states the following. On this occasion, Water Beach Parish Council is unable to arrange representation in person, so please can you arrange for a statement below to be read out specifically. Water Beach Parish Council have highlighted a number of important concerns in their objection. The new town is a finished development, and yet this application is very urban and has some serious drawbacks. A, the reduction in footpath widths is not appropriate, especially given the emphasis being put on active travel. B, the use of wood in the pavements should not be permitted as it will need long-term maintenance which will increase the cost for residents. C, trying to reduce cars in the development is not appropriate for these first developments where there is no public transport infrastructure. Bus provision only starts at the 150th occupied house and as yet there is no indication of a level of service. D, the proposed layout is likely to lead to car parking issues such as pavement parking as it is not clear, adequate off-road parking provision can be supported in this design. E, the amenity space to the south must be provided before occupation, as there is minimal private amenity space. The space will be safer for children's play if houses overlook it. Moreover, the parish council feels that Anglian Water's concerns regarding increased flood risk of flooding downstream have not been clearly addressed. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I'd like just to start by responding to the Parish Council's comments and then I'll do some wider updates and then I'll do my presentation if that's okay. Thank you. So in response to the Parish Council's most recent comments, they are broadly similar to the comments they made in their initial response to the plan application. So mostly covered in my, in my report. However, I'll just go into a response to them point by point. So A, footpath width. 
This was responding from the parish council to an initial comment from the county highways officer, and that's covered in the report. The footpath widths are two metres wide, acceptable to the county highways department, and are in accordance with the design code and are suitable for adoption, subject to a section 38 adoption process. Point B, wood in the path. Again, this is responding to an initial comment made by the county highways officer. Again, it's covered in the report. Those areas in proposed adopted areas will be covered by the county council estate uh, specifications. For those areas not within proposed adopted areas, a detailed proposed materials schedule will be subject to planning commission with materials proposed to be in accordance with the design code. Point C, parking standards. They are also covered in the report. The standards are in accordance with the local plan and design code. The aim of the new town is to get people to change their habits about driving. There are opportunities provided so that you do not have to use the car to access facilities. There are footpath links to local employment areas not currently safe and accessible by bike, as well as to Cambridge and to the railway station. These will be in place before the first occupation. The bus link will be by 150 dwellings. But there will be a travel hub adjacent to the site, which is subject to a separate specified planning application. That will be required to be in place by first occupation. This will include a location for electric bikes, scooters, and car cubs. This will be linked to improvements at the existing railway station by first occupation, such as improved cycle parking, all subject to separate planning and discharge of commission applications. We will agree a travel plan for key phase one of the site and a transport review, traffic review group, which will monitor usage. Uh, Point, point D about street layout. Again, the parking is in accordance with the local plan and the design code. The new design within the site, which I'll come on to later uh, through my PowerPoint presentation. Tracking plans show how the street works for motor vehicles. The tertiary street within the street scheme is five meters wide, and with cars are about 1.8 meters wide. Vans are 2.2 meters wide, and refuse spaces are 2.5 meters wide. So vehicles can pass on these tertiary streets. And if you park on the northern side of the street on the footpath, you'll be parking in front of someone else's garage. So it's been carefully designed so cars park in the appropriate location. Point E, amenity space. Again, see the report, but the open space to the south of the site will be required by first occupation, place space in the year following first occupation. Location of the amenity space is in accordance with the code, and the building is overlooked open space. Finally, point F, angry water, no objections. The, lo the lead local flood authority comment on surface water drainage and they have no objection. Um, the key phase one surface water drainage strategy is already approved and the key phase one drainage infrastructure is already approved and this application connects to one of those already approved um, infrastructure uh, schemes. Um, I'd just like to, do, to give you two more updates. Um, so in my report, I had said that the lead local flood authority had informally accepted the scheme. The, the, they wrote in with a formal removing their objection to the planning application. It was just a couple of hours too late for the formal report last week. So that, that's, that, that came in early last week. And one final update for members, the national planning policy framework was updated last week. Um, and I think well, I, I'm of the view that this application is ahead of the curve in terms of its um, response to the government's agenda on improving uh, quality of design. There is one particular uh, and more specific point that the National Planning Policy Framework updated last week, and that was about street trees in every, in every street. And you will see when I come to the PowerPoint presentation that this scheme has, has trees around the site and also trees within the site. So it addresses that specific point that the MPPF commented on. Um, I just want to make a point about um, member, represent, uh, member of the public representations. I, I said a response in my report, a response from one local household. It was actually two people, two people responded, but in the same household. In my report, I, I said one local household. It was actually two responses, one objection and one neutral. So if I go to my PowerPoint, is that okay? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Right, so if I um, go back to the share. Let me just try and see if I can share.
right. The members? Yep, we can see that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. So the application is uh, parcel one in the Newtown Stone Bond, is that appropriate? So to reserve matters application for 89 dwellings for, for appearance, means of access, landscaping, layout and scale, pursuant to condition three of the Outline Plan Commission. <coughs> this is uh, an aerial photograph. Um, if you look at Google Earth, um, currently there's, there are some changes to, to the aerial photograph because there's a lot of work going on around here where my pointer is. But this is the, where the red line is, that's the site of the current application. As you can see, quite some distance away from the village, the, the applicant's key phase one, the first 1,600 houses, is in this general area here. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Um, in that general direction. But this is the site adjacent to existing area of woodland. And that is, that is it currently. So you can see a lot of earth moving going on. And that's the woodland that you can see oh, there. So that's the site. Uh, I'm just reminding members of the, this is the SPD plan that showed the, the wider Waterbridge Lee Town. And again, just for highlighting purposes, that's the, um, that's the location of the site. Apologies to turn things on its head, but this plan only kind of fits in, in the other direction. So um, if I go, this plan, this plan is north to south. This plan is north to north is on the north is on your left. So this plan is um, a uh, regulatory plan. This is the plan that's attached to the design code, and the regulatory plan drives the development, the design of the development, the spatial design of the development. And if you can see my pointer, that's the site uh, to the left of the woodland, and this is the whole of key phase one. So members will remember that they approved the design code for key phase one back in June of last year. Um, you don't have to crank your head for the next plan because that's the extract from the regulatory plan describing parcel P1. So parcel P1 has some spatial, spatial elements to it. Of, of particular importance is the community link through the middle, which is a north-south link with a local area for play in the middle. Now, a local area for play is not an equipped area for play. It's just a place to sit. Um, there is one way into the site by vehicles, which is the blue arrow here. So that would enter what's called the tertiary street, which is the red and white dotted line. Now, that red and white dotted line is, doesn't, it, the, blue, the blue point has to be, that's fixed, but the red line means it could be anywhere within within the parcel. And then there's a point at the western edge where cyclists and non-motorised users can get out onto the wider cycling, cycling or the um, non-motorised user network. The blue dotted line to the east of the, of the parcel is, a, is what's called a secondary street. And then the red or the, the, the red burgundy dotted line to the north is the primary street. So vehicles access P1 by coming along the primary street from the secondary street and then into the site through a tertiary street. There's no car parking access for any of the dwellings on the north or the east or the south or the west. All car parking is through the centre of the parcel. The, the numbers one, two and three show different types of buildings, how they relate to each other. One is, uh, is terraced, is, is, is terraced at the front. So we've got Water Beach Woods to the south and, uh, and uh, you can see down here, just, just at the bottom, neat. That's a, that's a neighbourhood equipped area for play. And over to the left, there's a SIP, which is a space for imaginative play. So there's play areas in a, in a general area. Then also just to the southwest is the primary school, and then, and then a public space here as well. So if we move on to the next slide. This is, the, this is how parcel P1 looks in its wider context in terms of indicative master planning. So this indicative master plan, and I have to stress indicative, is how all of these areas on the first, this is called key phase one north. So this is the first bit of, of roundabout 900 dwellings 
um, how, how this had been planned in. Um, and again, you can see the location adjacent to the primary school, adjacent to the woodland, um, and uh, not very far away down to the lakeside, which will be accessed by cyclists as well down here. I'll come on to the cycle access a bit later on. <coughs> this plan is an axonometric plan viewing the site from the northwest. So if we go back at kind of viewing it from here, looking that way, so very important as, the, as one of the main ways in, into the new town. It, it, um, there's a variety of scale within the parcel and the park, the variety of scale meets the parameters set out both in the parameter plan attached to the outline planning permission and in the design code, which clearly dictates, shows where different scale, scale zones can be. This is a view, again, from the northwest towards those buildings. And down here will be where the school plaza, one of the locations the school plaza is. This is a view from the north looking down the community link. So it's a 13 metre wide community space with cycle for non motorised users and a lap in the middle of it. <coughs> this is the um, news within the parcel. And um, you can see where I'll show you a plan later in, in, in plan form where the cars can where the cars would park. And this is the this is a few photographs of the southern edge. So this relates to so the bottom left photograph shows the subs detailing, which is outside of this parcel. This is this subs detailing has already been approved. So the development would, its surface water would drain into these, these subs details. The, the photograph of the image, sorry, the, the image to the north is of the same view from a different location. Well, it's the same houses from, a, from, a, from the woods. So that subs detail there is that subs detail there. And it's also in there. So these three images are all of the same street scene. This is uh, the elevations from the northern on the northern side. So this is the first key building as you on the top left hand corner along the main street. There's the greenway. So if I, I'll just go back a couple of plans so you can. So this what I'm just showing you is that view all along there. Yep, that's all right. That's the view. And that's all in accordance with the design code. That's the view from the um, east. So I'll show you the east and the west actually. So I'll show you. So one of the views is along there. And I'll show you the other views in a minute. That's the view on the southern elevation that I showed you the three, the three rendered images before. That's one of the views within the Muse. That's the, other, that's the other view of the Muse. This plan shows the wider context. So we've got the green link here, right through the middle. That takes you further down towards the, towards the lakeside and towards the other facilities. We've got this diagonal cycle path going from the southeast to the northwest and that takes you towards or that takes you all the way down to the village and then that also takes you towards the research park. So currently there's no safe way to cycle unless you want to cycle the A10. There's no way to cycle from Water Beach Village to the research park at uh, Land Beach Marina as it used to be called. That all of this infrastructure is already under construction at the moment. I got planning permission um, last year and so this development feeds into all of that. There are also other cycle paths that will, will be provided by the occupation of the first dwelling, which again will all connect to this development. Um, this will go, this, this, this um, green link goes north as well, but there's nothing yet put here. So when, when the development will be in this next, if this, if this is the second phase, if that's what happens, then this will all connect. But there are also other connections to the east. Um, 
when parcel when this parcel comes forward next there'll be further connections so effectively this this scheme will connect into lots of other more strategic cycle and footpath and number of choices in a number of choices of connections but for vehicles for cars the way in at the moment is through the primary street off the a10 in there and then in there and what is interesting in this particular point here is where all tertiary streets access onto secondary streets the cycle path footpath has priority over the road junction so as you see so that effectively the give way for vehicles is there not there is that can you see that is that clear yes thank you yeah so that means that the footpaths in in Water Beach and in town, the footpaths have priority on the secondary junctions. And also the same here. You see that one there? So that's that's outside of the red lines, so that's already been approved. But as this particular development connects to the secondary streets, cyclists and pedestrians have priority. And that's a sea change in how people in how people work, how they how cyclists, pedestrians and the car drivers interact. So that's um, and this development parcel is the first one that we'll see how that how that works. Um, and then again, I know this is not within the site, but this is out, this is adjacent to the site. This is where the this is the aim for most of the um, because the primary school has been designed also in a way that the cycle uh, car drivers will not find it easy to get to the school. Um, people will be able to walk and cycle all around here, and that's their main. That's the main place where the school drop off is for site for, for people not driving. So this this building this this development has a relationship with that area as well. <laughs> and this plan this plan describes the, dis, the the dimensions of the footpaths and the roads and the highway, which sat, which have satisfied the county highways officer, which means that this road this tertiary street can be offered for adoption. This plan is the affordable housing mix plan. Now, members will recall when when they approved the outline plan application for urban civic for the six and a half thousand houses, there was discussion at length about the the viability view and the affordable housing proportion within the the, um, the development, and it was agreed that there would be a minimum of thirty percent affordable housing throughout the site with review mechanisms at certain stages. With the aim of uplifting that 30% to 40%. Um, this parcel, this development parcel, is 31.5% with four different affordable housing tenures in agreement in accordance with the government's definition. So the orange, they're um, affordable rent dwellings. The brown are um, rent to buy. The dark green which is um, that one there is discount market sale and then the light blue dotted around they are um, uh, shared ownership as you can see a variety of affordable housing tenures um, uh, not all in one place and i think this is my final slide so this is my final slide but it's by no means the least important people could, could argue it's the most important one of, one of the one of the things that um, this scheme is doing, which is a, sends a great message for the rest of the development, is that it is electric only. So there's no natural gas attached to this development. Um, it's all the uh, with the aim of removing fossil fuels. So it's uh, quite. I mean, it, when, this is not the this is not the first scheme that I'm aware of. In, in any of the urban extensions or new towns that's got gas only, but this is the first, so it hasn't got any gas, electric only, but this is the first residential scheme on this new town, which sets the standard for the rest of, rest of the new town. Um, that's the end of the slideshow, and I will stop presenting. Thank you very much, Mike. And, and um, what we've been doing is having a lot of the questions as part of the debate so that we've got a good flow in the debate. But I did see that Dr. Richard Williams had a, a question while you were talking, so please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's actually slightly gone past the point of that because what I was wanting was for the officer to indicate where in the report 
of the points he was referring to, whether he was talking about the parish council, but I can, that, that's past now. I can leave that okay. to Thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, and so now we'll move to the public speakers. And we have with us Robert Wilkinson. Mr. Wilkinson. Hello, can you see me? Hello, and we also have with us Sean Martin, Paul Cutler, and Julia Foster. Good, thank Good you very much. So, as I understand, Mr. Wilkinson, you'll be the main speaker for the three minutes, but that um, all of, everybody will be available in order to answer any questions that members may have. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Good. And um, Mr. Wilkinson, so you, you know the procedure. You have three minutes to speak. Mr. Carter will let you know when there's one minute remaining on, um, through the chat. Okay. Thank you very Thank you, much. Chair. So if you would like to start now. Yeah. Uh, good morning, members. Uh, I'm Robert Wilkinson, Managing Director of Stonebond. I also have online with me colleagues who can respond to some more specific questions that you may have regarding our proposals. Stone Bond's extremely proud to have been selected by Urban and Civic, and we have worked closely with your officers and wider team to deliver this extremely exciting project, and we recognise the opportunity and responsibility of meeting the very high aspirations for this new community. Stone Bond was founded in 1975. We're a medium-sized house builder based in Chelmsford in Essex. We have a solid track record of delivering new homes with over 45 years' experience in the industry. As you're all aware, the outline application has already been approved and it is the first residential parcel of this which you're being asked to consider today. This parcel, along with the first primary school and the comprehensive landscape, recreation and play space at Northern Woods and around the new gateway to the new town, will form the first new neighbourhood at Water Beach Barracks and Airfield. We realise we're setting the standard for what will come we have employed internationally renowned architects and designers to shape the proposal, responding to the approved design code. The code demands a high quality and sustainable development, and we have sought to rise to this challenge. The intention is not just to permit residents to adopt healthy and sustainable lifestyles, but to act actively facilitate and encourage it. The scheme embodies many features that support this. Firstly, the scheme is all electric, pursuant to government targets have no gas boilers by 2025. Every homeowner will have access to an electric vehicle charging point. Air source heat pumps are designed in from the outset. We have also designed the fabric of the buildings with thermal and solar efficiency in mind. The car is not excluded, but the scheme is designed to put cars out of sight and mind. Parking and garages are concentrated within the buildings and undercroft to enhance the street scene uh, and the quality of the landscape. We encourage cycling and walking to become the obvious choice as residents step out of their front doors. Every home will have a convenient cycle store. We have thought carefully about rainwater and stormwater management, including rain gardens, permanent paving to hold back and discharge the primary system. There's high ambition for biodiversity on the site. Considerable effort is being focused upon the wider landscape and habitat creation, carefully selecting the planting uh, species. There's a variety of different homes to meet different needs, age groups and incomes, and we're delivering homes that are affordable to live in, as well as affordable to buy. All of our homes will be of the highest quality and entirely tenure blind. I hope very much that you can give support to our proposals, enabling us to begin construction on a very special first residential phase at Water Beach, setting the benchmark for future phases and delivering the scheme that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for sticking to the, the time so ably. Um, and naturally, we're about to determine this, and we'll have some very um, important questions come, but it is good to hear that we're, we're talking about the you know, high aspirations, high standards, and setting benchmarks, so we will need to look at that now as we determine this application. Members, do we have any questions? Councillor Dr. Claire Thornton. Um, yes, just a point of information, Chairman. On um, page 7, um, the uh, point 41 um, under the representations, um, 89 dwellings, um, is that the maximum number of dwellings? A minimum number is given of 70. Is 89 the maximum? 
Thank you. That is a question. Yes, it's a question to the case officer, I think, more, but yes. Um, Mike, are you there? Do you want to answer that question? Thank you, Chair. Um, there isn't a maximum for each, for each parcel. The design code is quite clear. Um, it's in the report that um, there is a minimum of each part for each parcel, and there is actually there's flexibility within each, the size of each parcel because the, there's a maximum number for the whole of the key phase of 1,600 dwellings. For each of the parcels, there's a minimum number for each of the parcels, but there isn't a maximum number. Thank you. And that, that's, that's covered in my report somewhere else in the, um, if I point to the Councillor uh, paragraph 66 in my report. Thank you, yes. Councillor Dr. Tony Walton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just two things for me. The Parish Council was concerned about the use of wood in pavements. Uh, are you actually proposing to use wood in pavements? Um, second thing, if I may, the design of, the, of that parcel, you seem to have what you, I guess you architects call a feature building or a statement building on the corner. Um, it's not something that uh, I guess is a preference based on some of the uh, discussions I've had with some of our uh, people from our villages. Why are you using a feature building rather than, I don't know, something else? The design overall is great. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying it's not. I'm just concerned that we seem to be going to this statement buildings in corners, and it's not necessarily what uh, a rural area like ours wants. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And do, who would like to answer that? Because that was, there's two questions there. Uh, I'll happily pick up on that. So, regarding the, the wood in, in pavement, uh, Mike picked up on this briefly earlier in, in that the materials will, will be conditioned. But the, the reference here is in relation to separating a, a, a pavement from a, a, a soft landscaped area, so a fairly normal traditional boundary between two different types of materials. So I, it will be a condition, but that's just to explain the, the context of the, to try and explain the context of the comment from the Parish Council. And in terms of the, the statement building, I, th I think the, these, when we get to this, this sort of discussion, this, this can be quite subjective. However, in our view and in, in, in the view of our architects and in, in, and, and in discussions with the uh, design review panel, uh, the, the, the feature buildings are on the corners of the site do mark uh, what we think is a, a, an appropriate and exciting entrance to the, to the uh, new town. And we believe this is particularly important for our section of the, of the scheme as being the, the first thing that is, is seen as, as it comes off the, off the A10 there. Hopefully that can, answers the question. Can I just ask Mike whether or not the design code that was adopted included reference to a statement building, just to understand that. Thank you, Chair. Yes, the, um, the design code is very clear that that area, that particular location and the entrance to the site required a statement building. So I think, Dr. Tumley Hawkins, we need to take that conversation inside, sort of planning in general about <laughs> how we go going forward, but we've already adopted a, you know, that as part of the design code. Um, Councillor Isla Newton. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I've got a point of clarification. If I can direct you to paragraph 115 on page 16, and then to paragraph 15 on page 27. Um, I, I don't know if these are two completely separate measurements, but one says um, no more than 110 litres per person per year, and the other one says 110 litres per person per day. 
Uh, I'm sure that's a typo. Mike, do you want to I, look at I, that? I, I'm so that sorry, That'll be a very deep bust, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry, Councillor Wilson. Yes, it's the, um, <laughs> I cannot remember what, it's, it can't be 110 litres per person per year. Um, <laughs> I, I, I thought we're, we're told to drink two litres of water a day, so um, I know. That, that's how it struck me. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely a typo. Right, thank um, you. I don't know if one of the developer team can, um, can remind me. Wh which other paragraph was it in, Councillor Wilson? 115 on... 115 on page 16. Yeah, I've got that one. And um, paragraph 15 on page 27. Yeah. Sorry, could I suggest it, it is yeah. 110 litres per day? Yes, that's right. That's right. Thank you. Um, th that was just my point of clarification. I've also got a question. Um, Looking at the the news um, area, um, it the 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 it suggests that this would be a place where people will also be walking and socialising, and it seems that is where all the cars will be concentrated. I, I wondered how how if any evaluation has been done of the numbers of car movements that are likely to be happening when when people are walking around, um, cycling and just generally socialising in that area. It seems like it's sort of quite a difficult mixture of um, pedestrians and cars being concentrated in one area. Yes, you want to introduce yourself yes, just one second. Good afternoon. Um, in, in terms of... Um, Sorry, do you still want to introduce yourself before you speak? That would be I'm just working planning manager here at Stonewall Properties, uh, this afternoon, Chair, and, and members. In, in terms of the relationship between the vehicle and pedestrians, it, it, it's been designed in a way that they can interact safely with each other. Yes, there's the uh, landscape uh, map and the news, and that's been uh, designed to um, be acceptable for equestrians, um, for cyclists, and pedestrians also given the, the, the primary sort of uh, uh, route for, for pedestrians. So it, it, it's been designed in a way that they can, they can work in conjunction with each other uh, rather, than, rather than being an issue in terms of conflict. Would you like to come back to that, Jason? Uh, I, I, I would just sort of like to have some idea of the volume of uh, vehicles that are, are expected to be accessing the... Um, Garages and the, the, um, the parking spaces. So I'm afraid I, I don't have that data at hand, but I wonder, Julia, is that something that, that you can pick up on? Uh, good morning, Julia Foster from David Lock Associates here, the planning consultants uh, supporting the applicants. Uh, obviously, we've, we've concentrated all of the, the parking in the, the core of the block. So in principle, uh, you would anticipate, you know, one, one car per dwelling or thereabouts. We've got parking provision at about 1.6 per dwelling, I think. Uh, so it, it will be a mixture of parking arrangements using street and garaging uh, and carport arrangements within that central block. But I think the more important point is that in doing that, in providing that central street, which is where most of the car parking is accommodated, we're making the environment around the parcel and on the edge of the parcel, the outward facing boundaries of the parcel car free essentially. So people are able to walk, cycle and move around the edge of the parcel without any conflict with vehicles. The north south community link through the middle of the parcel is car free other than the crossing point right in the center where the new street crosses over the link. And again, that's been very carefully designed to give priority to the north south pedestrian cycle equestrian movement rather than the east-west car movement. And obviously, only half of the parcel lies off to the west of that crossing point. So, uh, you know, you would anticipate half of the parking is accommodated before you get to that, that crossing point. So it's a pretty low-key internal street in exclusively designed for the use of the residents within that parcel. There's no through movement for vehicles. You can't come out of the other end once you're in that space. So it should be low speed and it should be the residents themselves of that parcel that are using that space, which will minimise the conflict uh, with, with, other, with other modes and other movements around the parcel. 
Thank you. Thank you. I think that was very, very useful help to clarify. But Councillor, Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Well, um, I just really want to applaud that the, um, you know, level of energy efficiency and then ambition for that um, here, which I think is excellent. Also, um, the decision to make this um, a, a fully electric um, development, I think that's also excellent. And um, if Chair would allow opportunistically, I just wondered, um, that did sort of trigger in my mind, well, what about the construction phase emissions and, and, and what, um, what are your plans, perhaps not for this development, but going forward um, on electric construction um, vehicles in the future? Not material to the thing, but if you'd like no, the I, response yeah, to that, then quickly, then we can um, have a quick response to that challenge. Yes, yeah, so this is clearly something that's on our agenda at the moment, and, I, and, and perhaps, uh, Councillor Harvey, I, I can have a separate discussion about this particular point with you offline, but it, it, is, it is something that we, we are considering. It's, it's something that is going to become uh, very quickly a part of uh, all construction uh, sites in the very near future. Um, I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're probably a fast follower in terms of ranking of where we are on, on that particular aspect, but happily, happily talk to you more about that outside of the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Thank you, Chair. My question sort of follows on from Jeff Harvey's, the first of Jeff Harvey's. Um, the reference to sustainability paragraph 413 onwards in our power um, very interested to see the reliance on electricity that Councillor Harvey referred to. However, there's a reference also to committed to looking to exceed 10% renewable energy. Now, obviously, this site will have much higher electricity demand than might otherwise be the case, given this level of uh, energy efficiency. And I just wonder what proportion of the total electricity used is likely to be generated on site uh, whether by solar or other means, or whether this will be entirely reliant on the grid. Thank you. I'm afraid I, I, we, we don't know the exact figures for how with the proportion that's going to be uh, generated on, on site, and, and it's going to be a very difficult figure to predict prior to actually the, the occupation of the, uh, of the properties. Uh, so, I'm unable to clearly answer your question. I, I don't know whether any colleagues can, can add any further flavour around that particular point. Please nod or not, the case may be. So, um, good morning, Chair and um, members. Um, uh, my name is Paul Cuddle from Urban and Civic. Uh, we're the master developers for the site. So, we, we basically um, uh, study and uh, work out the, the grid load for the 1600 houses that we've got uh, for the key phase one, uh, drawing from the grid. We're always exploring where that source uh, is, especially going forward when we build out beyond the 1600 uh, in order to get um, sustainable sourcing for the overall development. Um, house, housing developers have to demonstrate that and the stone bond have in delivering um, the power loads that they're feeding off our uh, off our grid, our supply to their um, for their parcel. For those who don't know, Urban Civic deliver service parcels, so it's almost like a plug and play um, for house builders. If they exceed that, then then they need to um, provide a, a sort of compensatory measure uh, of power generation. But uh, Stone Bond have not exceeded that for our for our calculations to that their parcel. Um, but it is something that we are obviously continuously uh, looking at uh, for sustainable sources uh, for the supply to the site as a whole, uh, as well as will be ongoing um, surveillance and ongoing sort of management criteria going forward uh, for looking for sustainable measures as our future um, key phases uh, beyond the 1600 homes uh, evolves. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Twinney. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I've got two um, points. Um, the, the, the first is a broader point. Um, and I'd be interested in what the applicants, um, have, or rather how the applicants would respond to the concern the parish council has raised about the lack of public transport and the fact that given having seen the map, that this development is going to be actually quite isolated when it's first built in, in, in sort of middle of fields. Um, the first residents of this area are going to have no choice, frankly, 
other than to have a car if they want to access a school or frankly go anywhere because they are in a very isolated north um, western part of the site um, and as we've heard there will be no public transport so I would be interested in um, what the applicant's response is to the parish council's concern that there is going to be significant on-street parking given as I say I think practically the first residents will have no choice other than to be car based I applaud the general aim of the scheme and I understand the problem that you've got in terms of building out a new scheme from nothing um, but we are starting with quite a dense um, sort of area here which as I say is very isolated um, so there is a I think a, I think a, a gap between the vision which I think we all applaud and the practical reality that the first residents are likely to find themselves in my second point is, is, is a smaller one but it could be a very um, important practical point um, to the first residents um, indeed all residents paragraph 122 of our report says that boundary fences will be designed to allow small mammals such as hedgehogs and one would imagine other small mammals as well which sound less cuddly than hedgehogs um, to move between gardens now again I applaud the intention there but how will that actually work in practice to have a boundary fence which presumably is going to have a significant gap in it if the hedgehog is going to move um, between gardens which incidentally the gardens are again actually much smaller than they would be if we had a less dense application thank you okay. thank, thank you Councillor. Um, so on, on the first the first question I'll, I'll actually do you mind if I answer question two first around around the, the mammals uh, and then with the first question I'll, I'll make a, a little comment around the, the, the car parking and then perhaps pass to Paul for a little bit of the wider context on, on that one please so that the the passage of small mammals mainly hedgehogs I think we're discussing here between the the, the gardens is it's it's not as as tricky as, as it may particularly sound at the bottom of a fence there is usually a, a gravel board um, or it's either either timber it is simply just making sure that there is a small hole for the mammals to be able to pass through on on there so that that that's in a nutshell how how that would would work that answers that question and then then, then turning to the the fact and we've just lost you but so if we turn to whoever was going to answer the next part mr cutler thank you yes that would be me chair so um it's a very good point about um uh, first residence on a first parcel uh, on any site uh, and we we completely understand that and our typical model is, is that we do a lot of uh, infrastructure work in advance of any house builder that comes forward uh, and Mike has sort of touched on this so this includes a uh, considerable amount of footpaths and cycleways um, that will be delivered for the first occupant uh, that will allow either connection to uh, the research park or the science park further south uh, near the A14 or to Water Beach Village itself um, we're also looking at I think uh, Mike again mentioned it with a, a sustainable travel hub we're calling it which will um, include a, uh, a small little car park um, almost like um, a park and ride type of system in a way um, that will also pick up uh, a bike hire system uh, as well as um, uh, but you know be you know cyclists are using it uh, to, for their own leisure as well uh, so there's a number of connection points and modes of um, sustainable travel that will be going forward and as you can imagine with the park and ride there will be a bus service and in the meantime we're also looking at a shuttle bus service that will also connect all the way through to the uh, Water Beach train station uh, as an intermediary measure that will be using some of the existing um, uh, infrastructure that we've inherited from the barrack base so as you can imagine there's uh, lots of roadways uh, runways and taxiways to those runways that we can actually take advantage of and connect um, e e outside of uh, the permanent stuff that we're building I hope that answers your question Yes, that's what you Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the answer. Could I just clarify then that, that those things will be in place for the first applicants, for the people who are in these 89 houses? Yeah, the, the occupants. That is, that is correct, Councillor. That is correct. And just one more thing about the hedgehog fences. As, as Robert picked up, they're, they're bespoke pieces of, um, uh, of fencing that, you, that are sort of off the shelf, but they are literally uh, small passageways and fencing. And it's all part of our biodiversity migration that we want to encourage. Uh, along the site as you know the uh, all sites uh, are, are aiming for 12 uh, 10 percent sorry we're aiming for 12 percent 
uh, biodiversity net gain. And so we're pushing house builders to deliver uh, what we envisage as very simple adaptations to typical fencing, but also bat boxes, bird boxes, et cetera, et cetera, in order to sustain and, and, and actually stimulate the biodiversity on our sites. Thank you very much. And in fact, they are included in our existing biodiversity supplementary planning document, encouraging um, everybody to use those. So thank you for doing that. In our new one that's just gone out for consultation, we'll be going even further. So as I know, it's fantastic in our villages. It's actually the scouts and guides that are going around helping and encouraging all households to have these little, um, little, little holes in everybody's fences to enable that to go through. And especially if we're intruding on an area which has been you know, sort of left natural for quite a long time, that's important. Dr. Martin Kahn. Uh, Councillor Williams uh, touched on something which I wanted to know. Uh, I found it difficult to uh, devise on a plan and I didn't notice anything in the actual um, description. Um, uh, what the provision is for private space uh, of the garden, uh, gardens, what proportion, which houses are going to have them. I, I'd be interested to know how much, how many of the build, uh, dwellings are going to have private space. Clearly flats won't, but the other ones. Uh, and what sort of sizes uh, are proposed. Sorry, I, I hope you can hear me now. Apologies for dropping off the, the call. Yes, hello, Miss Wilkins. We, we can't hear you very well, but try again. Sorry, so apologies for dropping off the the, the, the call. Hopefully, you can you can just about hear me. Yeah. I'm afraid I I couldn't catch all of that question. Uh, I heard about private community space, and perhaps, Julie, I'll pass to you in a moment, but ev every dwelling, including the apartments, rooms, and balconies, will, will have private amenity space, uh, and that will be in accordance with the, with the required policies and guidance. But, Julia, I wonder whether you could perhaps elaborate on, on that. I can. Um, I wonder whether it might be helpful to actually um, share the... Uh, the, the landscape plan. Um, am I able to do that? Or Mike, is that something that you... Yes, of course, um, Mike, Mike can share that again. Or well, you can share it if you've got it straight there. You've got permission to share, if you advise. I, I have it in front of me, but I, I don't seem to be able to share my screen. So, uh, Mike, I, I don't know whether you're able to pull up I the... I just can't find it, so it's a landscape plan. Isn't well, it? there's one on page 23 of the design statement, which is particularly good, because it's got all the garden areas highlighted. Um, if that's possible. And I'll just take this opportunity to ask members to make sure that we speak clearly into the microphone. It's been a bit hard, not only for their, their issues, but also for them to hear us clearly, I'm afraid. Meanwhile, Councillor Eileen Woods, I'd like to move to the debate, unless your question is burning for the... I've got that you've asked, asked another question. Don't ask it just yet. It's just whether or not we could move to the debate. Um, I, I've just got two very quick questions. Can I, can I just say, um, Chair, while Mike's looking for that landscape drawing, um, that in the design code we have specific requirements for uh, private amenity space. And it obviously varies for, for the size of dwelling and the number of predicted occupants that house so um, uh, uh, Stonewall scheme complies with the design code on that front. Thank you Dr Martin you can see that now is that okay that's answer your question thank you that's a very helpful diagram thank you very much um, and we just have two more questions from Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you Chair um, my first question is um, the, the road um, coming off from the A10 into this development will that also be the road that will be used by the construction vehicles for other parcels being built, because it seems to me that that, that would cause a lot of um, heavy traffic going past this development. My second question is whether um, it, it's good to see that cycle provision is being made for all these dwellings. Will, there be, will that provision include enough space for cargo bicycles? Because I know that people are using these more and more when they're ferrying their children around to avoid having to use their, their cars. Thank you. Yes, that's a big design issue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. 
Uh, so if, if I can answer uh, both those points, and feel free anyone to, to jump in to, to, to add. Um, but with regards to the Hall Road, it's a very important point that the council raises. So what we do is we actually separate the Hall Road from um, the, that main primary street. Uh, there may be a short amount of, uh, of sharing because what we do is we branch off as soon as we get into the site um, off the A10 and then we loop around. It's, it's something that we, we're very keen to make sure that construction traffic is away from uh, people who actually live there and making it their home. Um, because as you know, the noise, dust, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is not something that residents would want to be um, uh, sort of sharing. Um, so we work very hard with the house builders and Stone Bond have clearly been part of the party um, for that. So uh, in short, to answer your question, the whole road is separate from the primary road. Um, and with regards to the sizes of the um, cycle carriageways, and predominantly where we've got to, we've, we've, we basically uh, created a, a strategic network of cycleways, which are primary and, and secondary, and, and some that are shared with uh, people as sort of footpath um, uh, and pedestrian users. And so predominantly on the, the more cycle posters, in particular the primary, they're three meters wide. So you can indeed use a, a cargo a bike um, on there, and even the secondary ones uh, will, will allow that. Thank you. Could I just clarify my question was about the cycle storage in the home? So storage and the you know the ability for these largest cargo bikes to yes. be able to get around. My my apologies. Yeah, my apologies. So we are um, aligning with and, and maybe Robert or Sean can uh, add about specifically about the stone bond um, sort of uh, bike storage. Uh, my apologies for uh, misreading uh, misinterpreting the question. But the uh, within the design code, we very much uh, designed the, the cycle allocation and spaces for uh, such things, very much aligned with the, um, the Cambridge and South Cam's guidance. Thank you. So we need to make, I'd like to move to the debate, if that's okay, members. Thank you very much. Um, good. So I think. Pardon me. I think we were waiting for the landscape plans to be displayed. We saw it. Did you miss that one? And Martin so I'm very it. happy to see it. Would you like to see it again? No. Yes. Thank you. Could we just see it again, please? Have to find it again. Sorry, <laughs> it'd be a, um, let me just um, Okay, thank you very much for showing that again, Mike. Yep. Good. So, members, we'll, we'll move to um, the debate. I think we've got time for a... Yes. So, and thank you very much for answering our questions and for the information that you've provided that was um, helpful. Thank you very much to all of you. And again, if you can turn your videos and microphones off. Thank you very much. We'll go on to the debate. Thank you. No, we don't have anybody from the parish council because we had that read out at the beginning and we don't have a local board member registered to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. So yes, move to the debate, members. Well, I don't think we're lucky. I think we've had, a, you know, that was quite a, a meaty, you know, clarification and <laughs> session. And thank you very much, Dr. Tim Hawkins. Uh, Thank you. Um, I must admit that um, the, the design that's been put before us today is one that has been very well thought out. Um, and I note also that in the answering of the questions, the concerns that the parish council have raised um, have been addressed. Um, sorry that they're not here to hear it <laughs> or for us to ask them about it. Um, but that certainly for me, um, makes it something that I think I can stand behind. It's good to see such a design starting at the beginning of a, a big project like this. And I would hope that um, other 
builders uh, will, <laughs> will follow suit. Um, and just say, you know, thank you for all those who work on this. I think the issue of the distance from the, uh, the distance of this parcel from the rest of Water Beach, um, the fact that we're going to be the first, means that we have to make sure that the transport plan that's being proposed actually is put in place because that will be key to making this model shift work. So that is something we need to um, make sure that we focus on and get right, right from the get-go. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just follow on from Councillor Hawkins, um, Councillor Dr. Hawkins' point, actually. I completely agree with that. I think if we are going to have a modal shift, it needs to be there from day one. There's no point having grand plans for modal shift for building a, a, an isolated parcel where people have got no option other than to use, use, use cars. It just won't work. So um, I completely agree. I, I, it is really important that that is there from day one and that people get into the habits that we're trying to, um, to encourage. Um, on the application generally, I, I will be honest, the design is not entirely to my taste, but I, I won't push that point because that, that's a safe point. Um, one concern I do have, well, I, there are two points that still do concern me. I am concerned about the density. Um, I, I obviously completely support our own existing and future biodiversity FPD, and as I raised at the thing about the, 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 the board where the hedgehogs can move through, but I think we can't get away from the fact that there are 89 houses here, it's quite dense, and by building 89 houses, you are cutting down um, the green space. So we're only talking about mitigating um, biodiversity and environmental issues. And we can only mitigate them because if there were fewer houses, um, we wouldn't uh, you know, have, have, we wouldn't be taking away so much um, space where, where um, animals um, are, are free to roam, as it were. So the density does bother me. It is very dense, it is very urban. I agree with the parish council um, on that. The gardens are very small, having just looked at that map, very small. Um, so we are you know, significantly cutting down the green space by building so many houses. Um, so that concerns me. Um, I'll be interested to hear what other members think. Um, I'm still on the fence in some ways as to how I would vote. Um, a very small point, um, and I, I'm not sure this is really a reason to turn down the application, but I did find the wood on the edge of the pavement a very odd thing. It will rot. Um, it will eventually rot, and it won't look very nice. Um, so um, so I, I, I do think that's an odd design feature. Thank you. Um, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I find, I, I too am on, on the fence a bit with this, and I think one of the other things to, to add is asking me to do something, Aaron, is this working okay? Just flashing this at me. Okay, stop now. Sorry, new technology. It's asking me to log off and log back on again, whatever that is. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I agree with the density. Um, and, and the gardens are going to be so tiny and small, um, and there's so many of them. But also, the affordable housing worries me um, in the sense that, you know, it's great that we've got more than the 30%. Obviously, we should really be getting 40%. But um, when it was shown about where the, where the affordable housing units are, yes, they're in different parts of the site, but part of our policy is also disbursement through the site. Now, some shared ownership properties, I don't know if we're able to bring the, bring the slide back up, some shared ownership properties are in a couple of places, but really, of that, of that square, the affordable housing is being shoved to two corners. There's, there's no other way to, to describe it. Now, that might be something that we think is is okay and comfortable with, but but I think we have to recognise that that's not what the policy says. The policy says it can be in small clusters, but it should be dispersed, dispersed through the site. It's and it's not. Um, and then when you look at it again, then with the with the gardens in those areas, you know, it, it's tiny. So. I agree with what members have said about the modal shift and being there from the start. It, it just, as others have said, it just won't work if it's not. So I think there are merits to this. 
completely agree with Wooden. I mean, I've probably got one of the most rural wards in the district. We have no wooden barriers on footpaths anywhere that I know of. I think when we look at the materials and conditions, I think that's a bit of a, a no-go, to be quite frank. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll listen to other members, but the affordable housing worries me, and it worries me as a trend potentially for the rest of it. You, if we want inclusion and we want this for everybody, then it needs to work for everyone regardless of their financial abilities. Uh, thank you very much. And Mike, I don't know if you have the slide again of the affordable housing. And while you're pulling that up, I think Chris Carter wanted to come back on, on the issue of materials. Uh, it was actually on the issue of density and, and oh. garden size, if I may, Chair, just, just uh, to try and assist the committee. So I think it's important to look at this parcel in the context of what will be, will be a new town. Uh, and the key part of the master plan for that new town is the strategic infrastructure, including strategic open space, strategic green space, the uh, blue spaces, the lakes, etc. So whilst the gardens for some of these dwellings may themselves be quite small, um, ultimately the whole town will be served by what is quite a comprehensive network of, of open spaces um, around the development. Um, just on the affordable housing, it's probably just worth as well in, in the context thinking of the, the mix. So of the 28 units, 18 of those will be apartments. And given the design and layout of the parcel, those apartments tend to be on feature corners. So that may be why some of that affordable housing is located um, in those particular parts of the site, um, noting there are 10 houses as well. But just to set that in a bit of context, this is the first of many parcels that will come forward on the new town um, and need to be seen in the context of the wider master plan as a whole, in my opinion. Thank you. Mike, did you have that is, slide? Is, the... is that up, Chair? You can see it? No, sorry. So, no. Uh, just also, also to confirm that the, the applicants work carefully with our housing our housing officers, and our housing officers are very happy with with the, this proposal. So, so your housing officers don't think that these have been shoved to the outward edges and basically, no. you know? No. Sorry, you did have it up. I, it was just behind me. I didn't see it. <laughs> Thank you. That's Heather Williams. Yeah, that, that's my interpretation of it. I didn't say it was officer's interpretation, um, <laughs> to be clear. Um, and I am, I think, allowed to have that view of it, um, Chair. So, so, yeah, you can see there that the shared ownership, okay, there's, has been sort of dispersed, but and you've got the flats. I, I do understand you can't separate the flats, but but more could be done to bring that, bring that in. And I understand what um, Mr. Carter is saying about the open space, and I think from the, you know, the master plan there will be, but this will be the first residence there, and it will take time to bring that other open space and, and for the whole town to develop. So it seems peculiar to be going so dense so quickly, and if, you know, the recent years have shown us anything it's it's the need for actually being able to be out and about and having that space even from the what public space open space really is there in that design thank you thank you very much mike for showing that um councillor peter bain thank you chair um three brief comments on this which may affect our decision the first one is sustainability now, of course, this is an interpretation of the existing design code. I referred earlier to paragraph 113. We're still working to the old, um, what I used to call the Merton rules, 10% uh, renewable energy generation on site. And I think it's important to bear in mind that the increased reliance on electricity in a site uh, increases rather than reduces the need for, um, uh, for renewable energy generation within the overall site, which is obviously just a small part of the, of the site, as was explained to us. Um, however, I think that is compliant. The second one is the, uh, the explanation that was given to us by the case officer earlier in relation to the NPPF change last week. Um, now, are these actually street trees? I don't know. To what extent do the statement 
or corner buildings actually meet the criteria of the NPTF, bearing in mind that this is not any longer to be seen as just a matter of subjectivity. That is part of the process. This is an objective test to be met in the future, as I understand it. However, it's only just been introduced, and I think we take it from our case officer that this does meet the requirements, so I accept that. I'm obviously disappointed that it's only 30% affordable housing, but again, that is a part of the wider negotiations for the site as a whole. I think it's important to bear in mind that our own district council definition of affordable rent for uh, RSLs changed again last week, and I assume that the new definition will be taken into account for those particular houses. And I should say that having made those points, I accept that we are setting a very high standard. But we know it is right that we set a very high standard because this is the first uh, of the detailed considerations that will come forward for a very important site. And I think that, by and large, I would say that I, I accept that the development is to a very high standard, and I would certainly be inclined to accept the officer's overall recommendation on it. Thank you very much. Does anybody want to clarify that issue around the affordable rent? Not no permission to do that. Okay. Um, Councillor Mark, Dr. Mark and Carl. <coughs> I wanted to uh, come back again to the a couple of issues that I, I, I'm concerned about. I, I am concerned about the size of, of the garden, uh, but I'm more concerned about the insulation. The basically, the line between two east-west the east west dwelling, uh, which, will, which will shade the Ortman, so they may be less, uh, uh, less attractive. Um, I see this as a problem. I mean, you've got high de density, you're trying to bring lots of things together, and you don't always, you can't, oh, sometimes there's too many things, you can't manage to get everything absolutely perfect. But I think this is something we do need to keep an eye on. Um, uh, likewise, this uh, possibility of conflict between dry, uh, of cars and uh, users of the central use area. I think this is a potential uh, zone of conflict. Uh, for instance, the uh, wall ring uh, marmalade lane development has a use area, but it is completely car free. Uh, 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 and therefore, it, and you can see this, how this makes use by pedestrians much higher. Um, uh, m m my concern, uh, generally it's a very high standard development. It's very evaluated. Uh, good development, a uh, good idea. But I, I am concerned that we keep monitoring how this actually works out in practice. Uh, and I would want some provision for these issues to be monitored as people develop. Because this is the, precisely because this is the first development, uh, we took the decision in going for high density development where there's plenty of green space, so there's lots of public space. That, that's a, it's a legitimate way of going forward, um, and that obviously is why we've got small, rather small private spaces. But I think it would be very useful to see how that works out in practice, how people react to that when they're living in it. Uh, particularly, um, this would be particularly a job for families with children, um, uh, and that's why where the conflict, for instance, in the, in the use area uh, uh, and pedestrian access and car with cars would be could potentially be an issue. Um, uh, and then learn from that so that for, as the further developments come forward, we can take account of those. So I would like, if it, I don't know if it's possible to require a, a, a survey after a period of time to see how it develops um, for, for I, or not, but um, I would like some information on that, but I would like to see that. Perhaps whether it's done voluntarily or by condition. Perhaps we could just interrogate a little bit more whether the travel plan does include monitoring that would then inform um, what's happening there? Are any further developments? Chair, through you, thank you. Yes, the travel plan certainly does require uh, monitoring and review. Uh, but beyond that, I think there's wider points you're obviously raising there, Councillor Khan. Um, the Council has a positive relationship with Urban and Civic, who are the master developers for this site, and I've no doubt, having heard the comments of the committee today, that we can take that away and have a discussion with them about uh, a mechanism or, or means for them to uh, agree to update us on the success of these parcels as they as they come forward so that we can you know, constantly review and improve as further parcels come forward in the future. I'm, I, in my opinion, it wouldn't be reasonable to make that a condition of this reserve matters application today, but it's certainly something that we can take away and discuss with, with Urban and Civic. And what I would like to suggest on the back of that is that it's just, it's also an update for the committee. 
rather than just hypothesis. So that would help us to understand as, as applications go forward as we develop that. We, we tend to think things, obviously. We, 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 we look at things which we think might be problems, uh, and we can only find out really whether there really are problems if we do some survey work and, uh, afterwards. So but maybe that, uh, it's a worry that Chair. we shouldn't be worried so, so, about. Yes, Mike. Chair. Sorry, Chair. Um, in the, the Section 106 agreement attached to the Outline Plan Commission has two two groups. There's a, there's, a plan, there's a project delivery group and there's also a transport group, which will be part, part of the role of those groups is to see how things are progressing and make changes to, 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 well, to inform future development as it goes forward. Thank you so very they're, much. They're, they're, they're part of the Section 106 agreement. Obviously, they, they, as, as development progresses, they'll be, get progressively busier groups as more things will be there to be, to be discussed. Thank you very much. So as I understand from this, so the, the travel plan has the monitoring, but you've got this um, transport group as part of Section 106 that will be looking at it. But what we've also specifically requested is in the relationship between the planning officers and urban and civic as part of the master plan, that you'll review this in the light of the comments that have been made here, and that they will feed back to committee. You know, um, I think that would be very important Absolutely. for us. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you very much. Do I have um, Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins? No? I don't have Councillor. Um, and I would have it's Councillor Jeff Harvey, Councillor Eileen Williams, and Councillor Heather Williams. And I would. Sorry? Yes. And um, then, if not hearing anything which is going so much, I'm not really hearing while we're going towards, and Councillor Claire Dornton, then I would have to call a break, I think. So I'm going to call a break now. If we take a 15 minute break, come back. Um, we have those people who are registered to speak. And um, then I hope we could move towards a vote, members. And meanwhile, so the officers would also be, you know, um, preparing their summary of what, what many of the reasons may be. So it is now 11.32. If we take a 15-minute break, and we're back here just after the lunch at five, so 11. Is there a discussion of these two extra second awards? Uh, there was the day when I don't have my watch, and that's the problem. So it's 1140. 11 so if we're back here, 5 to 12, please, everybody. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is South Cambridge District Council Planning Committee, um, and we're taking up again with the Water Beach New Town application and the debate. And we have four speakers registered to speak at the moment, and I've indicated that hopefully after that we would move to a vote. We'll see what, depending on how the debate goes. So, Councillor Jeff Harvey first. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I was um, just a bit surprised at the um, focus on the wood and the pavements. Um, I suppose. From my point of view, I think natural materials are known to um, improve a sense of well-being, well especially um, mental health benefits there. Um, and I, I'd rather prefer to leave that to the architect, really. I, I know, for example, it depends on type of wood. I think oak, when buried in the ground, is a lifetime of 25 years. I'm sure it could be a lot higher than that if it were thought about carefully. Um, so that's one point. And also on um, Councillor Heather Williams' concerns about the placement of um, affordable housing. I think we've got to remember that this is like just one patch in a, in a, in a sort of um, patchwork quilt, if you like. So I, I think if we if you're talking about putting all affordable housing in, in, in one corner of the airfield, then um, you know that would be a different matter. I wouldn't have any concerns about this, given it's going to be embedded eventually in lots of other similar patches. Thank you. Right, thank you. And we have Councillor Eileen Mawson. Um, yeah. Thank you, Chair. So I, I just want to say that I, I too was um, quite concerned about the um, the concentration of homes, but then I thought this is a new town, it's not a new village, and towns do tend to be more densely packed together. I grew up in the middle of London uh, in a small flat, and my, my outdoor space were the local parks, which I really enjoyed and I missed. Um, so... I still have concerns about the um, the mews and the potential mix of pedestrians and uh, and cars. But as we discussed, if we can keep some sort of supervision of that to see how that that works and how that would work for future development. But all in all, I can't see anything that would cause me to want to not accept the recommendation of the officers and. Having had the opportunity to go around the whole site of Water Beach and seen all the greenery, the, the, the open space that the, the people living there will have, I think even if the gardens are small and the houses are concentrated, that there is going to be so much open space that there will be a good quality of life for people living in the whole development. And thank you. Um, and Councillor Dr. Fred Anderson. Um, well, I'm, I, I'm really sort of following Councillor Wilson's remarks, and I, I, I myself am, am concerned really about the, the urban nature of the design, and particularly the what are referred to as the key corner buildings. I think that Councillor Dr. Tuma Hawkins picked that up right at the very beginning of the meeting, and I'm, I'm really not sure about those and, and the, the, the size and the mass of them. But then I'm reminded, um, as Councillor Wilson said, that this is a town, it's a new town. And, and so, you know, it is going to be, there is going to be the um, reflection of the, the urban nature of the development. Um, so uh, I, I think that my concerns, I think, have been, um, I have to take those into account in, in, in the general development of the whole, of the whole town, of the whole site. And Councillor Williams. Thank you. Um, I, I'm still sort of not um, entirely sold by the it's a town so we must. And that feels like it's becoming, oh, but it's a town. It's almost like the fact that it's a town has become an excuse. Now, I spent the first years of my life living in a town um, in Letchworth. Letchworth has... Lots of open space, it has big gardens, it's a garden city, it is a town. So saying we're going to do this because it's a town doesn't, it, that's not an automatic foregone conclusion. There are different ways of designing and building towns. Um, so I think we could afford to have, and given it's the first area as well, a lot of the things in this master plan are going to take decades to come online. And meanwhile, we're going to have residents in this isolated area 
Um, and I think that needs to be taken in, into consideration as, as well. So I'm not saying, you know, 100%, but I think we've got to stop using it as an excuse for things that we don't quite like. We either like it for the town that we're looking to build, or we don't. Um, but it's not just, you know, it's a town, so it's okay. Um, the other thing I was going to say about, I, th I think um, Councillor Khan was saying about the survey, and it was mentioned about with Urban and Civic, I think it's important that that survey does happen. However, I don't think it should be something that is developer-led. I think it's something that for us to get proper reflection, it's something that we need to have as independent as possible. Therefore, I would be hoping that the council will be engaging with um, with the residents there to see their thoughts, rather than going through a, through the developers. Um, and so that way we can have an element of independence and control over, over the questions that are asked, rather than giving that away. And for that reason also, I don't think it's really reasonable, as, as Mr. Carter has said, to, um, to put it in as a, he wouldn't meet the reasonable tests to require the developer to do it anyway. So that would be my two pennies worth on the survey. Thank you. And just to pick up on that, um, Councillor Williams, is, um, Mike, if you're there, just in terms of Section 106, the, the transport group and project delivery group, do any of those have, um, you know, both council and resident involvement at all? I was just wondering. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll just open it up and I'll close it down again. So, you know, it's to, um, um, I'll just, let me just, um, because I'm just, I'm just reading the, the definition of what's called a progress and delivery group, and one of the. So just move it along. I'll just search for PDG. Here we go. Um, next, next, next. Um, it's like one of those one of those generations that you get if you're visually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm nearly there. Uh, right, the, um, the PDG, the Progress and Delivery Group, will be committed to facilitating the comprehensive delivery and design of the wider site. The role of the group is as follows, and this is the District Council and the County Council and the developer. Um, it's to um, have a role in uh, assessing and anticipating cumulative impact effects of other developments being brought forward, um, providing such information providing such information and or assistance as the District Council may reasonably request to enable it to prepare update reports to its members as to the progress of the delivery of the development of the wider site, monitoring or any general update. Um, and there's another one. Um, the ongoing, the approach to the ongoing design for the development across the wider site and the observance to the provisions of SPD. There's several things here about um, delivery, monitoring, observing, um, uh, um, maintaining the integrity of the spatial design. Um, obviously, there's another one in there. Uh, it's to provide a forum for members to share information and collaborate. So it's learning. And, and so, um, Mike, would some of, at the moment, it's not explicitly mentioned to the residents of that, but what um, I think is being raised is the, is the concern that we, that it's not just the council and the developer, but also the residents are involved. Mr. Carter, would like to come in? Thank you, Chair. I, I don't know whether it's explicitly mentioned in the Section 106, but as with our other new settlements, if you take North Stowe as an example, um, as residents start to move into the site, you'll be aware that our, the South Towns District Council community team takes a much more active role, uh, take part in community forum meetings, residents' meetings, and that's a really good way of uh, enabling that feedback loop to be completed. So residents have a chance to speak directly both to uh, community's officers, but obviously their, their local ward councillors as well. Um, I've also had it confirmed in the break from Urban and Civic that they're more than happy to share any monitoring work that they do um, with this committee um, at any time. So um, hopefully that provides some comfort from everyone as well. Yeah. It also says it has a facilitating consultation and community forum feedback role as well. There we go. So maybe what we're, we're saying very strongly is that we'd like to see specifically around these issues that have been raised in, in committee, but um, around that active travel part and the the number of cars within the residential area, just that mix, how that's how that's being managed, and whether or not they really do have that active travel options from day one. Thank you very much, Mike, for that. Um, I have no more 
speakers. And I think there's what's been excellent, members, in this debate is really around the concerns of any of the residents in the parish council. You know, those have been significantly debated today as well through, and had them addressed by the case officer, but also in, in debate. Um, the recommendation that I'd like to move to is um, on page one, which is approval subject to the conditions which are laid out on page from page 18 onwards. Thank you very much. Subject to the conditions laid out. Right. From page 18 onwards. Chris, do you have anything to say to sum up beforehand? So, members, um, I haven't heard anything that says somebody's definitely considering refusal, but on the fence. There you are, okay. So, we'll take it to the vote. Um, so, we'd need to consider the reasons then, yes. The reasons that we've, I've heard so far, Chris, if you would start, if you'd help me. So, one would be around, in terms of the principle of development, I'm understanding, in terms of the density issues. And in design code, I think you're talking about the urban nature and amenity issues in terms of the small garden area. That's what I understood. Chair, uh, I, I think I'd like Councillor Richard Williams to perhaps advise if there's some specific policy hook we'd be using um, here, whether he's looking across the HP1 design principles, and if so, any specific aspect of that. Well, it's the density is the key point for me. I'm afraid it's, it's 30 percent over the minimum. I, I accept there's no maximum, but given that there's no maximum, we have to put a line somewhere. It's nearly 30 percent over um, the density um, of the minimum density, um, and I, I think it, it is the urban nature of the uh, of the development and the density. Um, and we, allied to that things like the small gardens. As a parent of small children, I mean, com communal green spaces are great, but, but they're no substitute for having a a decent sized garden that the children can play in. Um, so, that would, so under HP1 design principles, that would be those, those issues. Thank you, members. Take it to the vote, <coughs> please. If you would press the, the blue person on the screen. Thank you. And That's everybody. Thank you very much. Would I like to cut it quite? <laughs> um, that is delayed. And so I'm pleased to say that ap application has been approved with seven votes in favour, two against, no abstentions. Thank you very much, members. Yes, and it will bring back Councillor Henry Bachelor for the next agenda item. And thank you very much for acting as vice chair. Thanks for staying. It's all about pushing the bar today's meeting. It's all about setting the standard, I think. Good. Members, we are now on page 33 of the agenda pack. It's agenda item six. This is for land west of 80 West Street Top. Um, application number 20 slash 03339 slash um, full application for the erection of a convenience food retail store with associated car parking. The applicant is the Abbey Group Limited and the Cooperative Group. Um, the application is being brought to committee because the parish council requested this and the officer recommendation is approval subject to the recommended conditions. The presenting officer is Aaron Coe. Are you with us, Aaron? Good afternoon, members. Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you very much, Aaron. Do you want to give us any updates and summary of the application? Yes.
Can I just check everyone can see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Brilliant. So just um, before getting into the details of the application, uh, there's a few additional updates. Since the committee report was published, a further six letters of support have been received from local residents and their com comments are summarised as follows. Residents would definitely make good use of this store, as well as the 2,000 plus students at Compton Village College in sixth form. The existing retail provision within Compton is inadequate. Um, the proposed store will reduce the need for Compton residents to travel outside of the village to fulfil their shopping needs. Due to the growing size of the community within Compton, they would benefit from another store. Secondly, since the committee report was released, an updated version of the MPPF has been published. However, the alterations within this document are not considered to impact the overall assessment of this application. And thirdly, the applicant has submitted a statement to members, which will be presented by them today. Uh, this document was circulated yesterday, so I hope that all members received a copy of this by email. Right, moving on to the proposal. So the site is located on land to the west of 80 West Street, Combaton. The land is situated within the development, village development framework of Combaton and lies between number 80 and an allocated housing site at Benham Farm to the east. The Cambridge Greenbelt lies to the north of the boundary of the site and the site is not located within the conservation area nor within close proximity to listed buildings. The site is located in flood zone one and is therefore a low risk site. So just to show a wider aerial view of the site, as you can see, the site to the uh, to the to the west of the site is um, Benel Farm, and as you see, it's under construction, um, and that's for 90 dwellings that are under construction at the moment. And there's a further 41 units being considered under a, an application at the moment, uh, so that's pending consideration. Uh, as you can also see from this aerial view, the site is immediately adjacent to Combaton Village College in sixth form. Um, which over recent years has expanded and now accommodates approximately 1,900 students. Um, it's just a couple of site photos. Um, as you can see here, you've got the Benelman Farm development to the west, and then on the east, you've got 80 West Street. So you can see the site is currently a vacant parcel of land uh, within the development framework. It's swelling close to the north and east and west by planting and trees. A hard and soft landscaping and a boundary treatment condition is recommended as part of the approval to ensure the proposal preserves the local landscape characteristics and do not have an adverse impact on the adjacent Greenbelt. The scheme has been reviewed by the Council's landscape officer and is supported subject to these conditions. So this slide shows the proposed block plan. The store is proposed to be situated, situated to the north of the site with car parking located in front of the store to the south. The servicing and deliver deliveries area is proposed to the west of the store and a vehicle tracking plan has been submitted to accompany the application which demonstrates the site layout is suitable for this arrangement proposed. This slide shows the proposed elevations. Um, in terms of visual impact, the proposed retail store would be set back from the public highway by 33.5 metres. The building is proposed to be of a modest height at 3.2 metres to the eaves, with a shallower pitch roof design, reaching a maximum height of 7.2 metres to the ridge. Um, in terms of materials, a buff brick with glazing and a sheeting roof is proposed, and an external materials condition is recommended <clears throat> to be reviewed by officers to ensure the materials are appropriate. Uh, this slide shows the proposed floor plan. As you can see, you've got the, the sales area, the back of house area, and then the plant, plant area as well. And you've got just a CGI to show um, a visual. So as set out in the um, committee report, the considerations shown on this slide are the key material considerations that members should be considering in determining this application today. In terms of principle, the scheme is considered to be compliant with the local plan policies E21 and E22. As a proposed convenience store is of a scale that is appropriate to the function and size of the village. In terms of retail impact, the development is not considered to result in a detrimental impact on retail uses within proximity to the site that would warrant refusal of the application. In relation to highway safety, the scheme has been reviewed by the county highways engineers and considered acceptable subject to conditions securing a servicing plan traffic management plan, details of levels and materials for the access arrangements. 
So to conclude the presentation, given the growing population of Compton Village with further approved residential developments taking place and the growth of Compton Village College in sixth form, it is considered the village of Compton is capable of sustaining an additional village convenience store. Subject to conditions, the proposals are considered to be compliant with South Cambridgeshire Local Plan 2018, policies S3, E21 and E22. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and as always, what we'll do is we'll bring any questions up if you stay with us when we come to the debate. Hey, Darren, thank you very much. Um, and we'll now go to speakers, and we have Dr. Richard Horn with us. He's wishing to object to the application. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? We can hear you very well. Are you able you to? You can. Put, okay. Are you able to put your video on? Uh, I'll try. I'm going to in the car right now. Oh I'll no! Do, oh god. Does that work? You, you are stationary, aren't you? Yeah, I'm no, I'm not driving. Sorry, my wife is driving. Good. Hello. Yes, we can see can you. you. See me now? <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello. So I, I think do you. Yes, do you know that you know the procedure? So you have three moments, three minutes to speak. And um, Chris Carter, who is here, he'll let you know when there's one more minute. I'll say that verbally as well if you're in the car, that when you've got one moment left to, to speak. Um, and thank you very much for being available to speak, obviously, when you're, you're quite busy. OK, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And uh, I should say, first of all, um, uh, we are uh, residents incompetent. We're neighbours. Uh, our property adjoins the back of the proposed site. And I'm also being asked to speak on behalf of the residents at number 80. Uh, their property is adjacent to the proposed site, and uh, they cannot speak today, I'm afraid. They're severely, one of them is severely disabled. So I'm speaking on behalf of, of them as well. Thank you. Um, just to review, originally planning permission was given for a house on this site, and that was granted. This planning permission now is to change that into a convenience store. I should just point out we already have a convenience store in the village, in the village of Compton, and there's one in the village of Tom, and it's well used. We also have a butcher in the village of Compton, again, well used, which sells fresh fruit and vegetables as well as uh, meat. So I can test the idea that this is, uh, if there's any demand really for this uh, shop. And we'll come back to that. But the principal objection here is about the problem of the location. The location is opposite the village college, competent village college. The score was something like 1,900 pupils, as you said earlier, and uh, a lot of teachers and, and, uh, and other people come and go. There's an awful lot of traffic which comes to uh, the, the school in the mornings to drop off children. We have uh, people in cars, we also have 25 buses which come and drop kids off. And we know, we're residents, we know what their traffic congestion is like. We live with it every day, okay? And that's fine, we just get on with it. But actually putting a shop opposite is going to increase that congestion. It has some small provision for car parking spaces. But you know what it's going to be like. People are going to be dropping off the kids and then walk off to the shop across the road. And they're going to be going in and backing out onto the road. It's going to create a huge additional demand and, and traffic problem as a result. And that's a real risk. That's increasing the risk. That's increasing the risk for children crossing the road and uh, going to, to and from school. Thank you. And you have one moment there's, left. Yeah. Okay, there's three lorries a day which are going to come along, additional litter, and the noise from the power plants which are actually going to operate all day and all night with um, having to keep them too cold. <clears throat> and you can do a certain amount which is to, to screen that, but you can't get off all, all the noise. There was a survey which I saw just this morning when I logged on, on behalf of uh, the co-op or the planning uh, application. They claim strong community support. I contest that's false. And the reason I, and the evidence I present to say that that is false is 34 objections, or 34 objections. That includes Compton Village 
uh, parish, parish council. They object, and they elected representatives on behalf of the whole village. They object to this. You also have the schools. They object. That's on behalf of the school and the teachers and the um, parents of the 1900 pupils they represent. So there's not strong support for this at all. So I ask you to reject this um, proposal on the grounds of safety, on the grounds of nuisance, and people there from early in the morning to late in the evening, on the grounds of traffic, and on the grounds of no community support for this application. Thank you. Thank the original you. application was for, a, was for a house. Please go ahead with the house and not the shop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Hunt, are there any questions that members would like to ask? No, thank you very much. Um, and I hope you can still you know, be able to hear the debate as it continues, Dr. Hun, um, whilst you're travelling safely. I thank hope. you. Thank you. Good. And um, we now hear from the applicant, Andy Brown, Mr. Brown. Hello, if you, if you slightly yes, move your... Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And if you slightly move your camera, we can see you. I don't know slightly. There we go. Yes. Better? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Turn the face. Is that better? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. And you do know the procedure. You've got three, three minutes to address the committee. And um, we'll let you know after two minutes. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair, members and officers. My name is Andy Brands, and I'm the planning director of the Abbey Group the intended developers of this new convenience store for the land adjacent to 80 West Street in Toft. I'm also representing the co-op that committed to become tenant should the application be approved. We consider that this proposal is an attractive new purpose-built co-op store which will offer better convenience food offering for the competent community. It would also create around 15 new jobs for local residents. The scheme is recommended for approved by the planning officer who noted that the proposal is an in an, an, an appropriate location for a new village shop. The scheme is also supported by the highways department and other statutory consultees. Last week, as we heard, following the lifting of restrictions, we undertook our own research of community sentiment and competent. We found that of the 145 local people that we spoke with, 110 were supportive of the proposal. This represents 75% of respondents. Many expressed a real and significant need for an improved food offering in the village about half saying it's currently poor and more than 90% saying they would use the new co-op store. Less than 10% of respondents surrounding the site were opposed to the proposal. We do not therefore consider that the objections from Compton Parish Council reflect the view of Compton residents who support the proposed new store. Respondents also appreciate the fact that the co-op is owned by members, not shareholders, and that they contribute a percentage of profits to local charities. So the co-op originally approached the Abbey Group in 2018 to identify that Compton was a location that suited their business model for a new convenience store for day-to-day -day shopping needs. Their decision included a detailed analysis of the viability of opening a new store in the village, taking account of the existing offerings. We identified this site as being a suitable for a new shop, owing to the location of the site within the development framework boundary of Compton, together with its proximity to the, to the village college and the Bennell Farm housing estate to the west, which is now nearing completion. We undertook pre-application consultation with both Toft and Compton Parish Councils, the school and nearby residents before submitting our planning application to the District Council. As part of the pre-application discussions to address concerns raised, we amended the location of the store in the site, the position of the access, included additional landscaping, as well as accepting restrictions on deliveries during school opening and closing times. Concerns were also raised about the impact on local shops, but both the Budgeons and the Top Shop have unique selling points such as their post offices and the sale of specialist food. It is inevitable that residents will pick up items whilst using those services. Co-ops successfully operate alongside stores and post offices in locations across Cambridgeshire, including Littleport, God Manchester and Whittlesea. Combatton is also a growing village and we consider there is sufficient expenditure to support two stores. In response to the comments made by local residents during the application, Co-op have accepted a range of conditions which would reduce and mitigate as far as possible any impacts upon local residents. These include store opening hours and delivery restrictions and conditions on noise mitigation measures. Traffic considerations have been carefully considered by the Highway Authority 
The car park design has been amended to reflect observations. The extent of car parking takes account of the use of the car park and other similar sized stores. So this planning application has been carefully assessed by officers in arriving at the positive recommendations to you today. We believe that the store, should it receive planning permission, would be an asset to the local area and it would deliver new employment as well as provide more shopping choice, with Clark being an integral part of the local community. We therefore urge you to support your ref officer's recommendation and to approve the planning app application today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I don't mind then, Ben, I've got a couple of questions. Anybody else got any questions? Good. Um, I think I was first. Oh, thank you. If you don't mind. Um, yes, I have two questions, if that's okay, Mr. Brand. So one is, you know, with something like this, which is obviously so important to, to see um, the responses from the parish council and from residents, I just want to ask you how you've done the engagement with parish councils. I'd really like to understand that um, with something like this, which is often when we're talking about our high streets, the vibrancy of our high streets, the needs of them, um, you know, it, it's, it's a key community um, asset. So I'd like to know how you've um, engaged with parish council. Um, and I hear that you went recently, just now, and got these other responses, but I'm interested in how you've dealt with parish councils. And a little bit more about the viability. You know, this is key. So if you said that there was a detailed analysis of viability, and we understand that high streets are struggling. So it would be very good to understand that viability post, during and post COVID, how that's um, proved, what's it, what, what you've learned from that, I think would be interesting. And thirdly, I'd like to pick up on some of the comments that have been raised by um, one of the parish councils. And it's something that we have seen in um, my ward in Orchard Park. And that is, especially when there isn't community engagement and work together with the local um, parish council is around the issue of litter. Um, and this has proven to be a real um, difficult issue to deal with, especially when you have such late hours. And whose responsibility is it for the litter that happens outside of the outside of the store um, and ways that that will be addressed because that um, I can imagine that'd be a key issue especially with lots of young people and coming out of the school too so those would be my three questions okay thank you councillor um, so I'll take those each in turn in turn in terms of the parish council engagement so um, obviously we were, were hampered by COVID in terms of meeting people face to face, but we did attend two um, parish council meetings for each parish, because obviously we're right under the, the, the border here between Toft and, um, and Combaton. Um, one of those was prior to the submission of the planning application to introduce the scheme uh, and to discuss obviously the various components of it. Um, and then obviously the second one for each parish was again during the um, initial consultation on the planning application to again present the scheme and to, to listen to, to feedback. Uh, as I said in the, my presentation, we did amend the scheme um, to try and address concerns that were raised. So hopefully that deals with point one. Um, in terms of the viability work, I mean, a lot, a lot of this is based upon the fact that Combatin is, is growing, uh, obviously because of principally the Bennell Farm development to the west. I think that the figures that are quoted in the committee report are from the 2011 census, and I'm aware of further development in addition to Bennell Farm that's been consented since then, uh, which is set out in the planning statement itself. Um, but, but certainly, I think the experience of, of co-op is that local stores are a, a huge community asset, um, particularly given the initial COVID restrictions that we all faced in terms of not being able to, or being housebound predominantly and, and needing to walk predominantly to, to, to shopping facilities. I think the experience we've found from the most recent consultation with local residents was that a lot of those are attending the larger stores in uh, the Morrisons at Camborne and the Sainsbury's at Eddington. So having a local facility that provides and, and supplements what's there at the moment uh, in terms of the budgeting offer will um, provide that additional um, convenience for people to be able to, 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 to walk to principally on a day-to-day on a -day basis. And then in terms of litter, I mean, obviously Corp are a very good tenant. We've got them on uh, 
their attendant of, of ours on other stores, um, I'm sure we would be happy to accept a, a planning condition if that were needed. I know it's been used on, on other stores that I'm aware of, which required um, some form of litter picking strategy to be agreed with the council. Um, obviously, as I said, Copper, I'd like to I'd like to think of a quite a responsible company and, and you know that they'll be um, very keen to, to make sure that the impacts outside of their site as well as within it are um, minimised as, as far as it can be. Thank you. Um, and I have perhaps Riley Norton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got two points that I'd like to raise. One, um, um, it was mentioned by um, the previous speaker about the noise from the um, ventilation fans at the back of the store. I note from the plan that this, the back of the store backs onto a, I think it looks like a house on the, on the plan. And from personal experience, I know that it's very difficult to mitigate the noise from those fans, especially in the summer. And what would this store do to make sure that no resident is disturbed by those fans? Because it seems to me that it's very difficult to mitigate that noise entirely so that people can't keep their windows open at night in summer. Um, so I'd like to hear some positive um, comments about that. My, my other point is that I've noticed in the papers that there will be a, a, an external cash machine. Um, I don't know if you're aware that um, quite often external cash machines become the target for um, um, raids and this causes enormous um, consternation to local people and it and quite often is quite damaging to the store so I wonder how much that has been thought through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Councillor. Uh, I'll, I'll perhaps say those in reverse order if that's okay. So in, in terms of the, the ATM, um, we're certainly aware of, of, of other uh, examples in Cambridgeshire of, of ram raiding, no, no better word for it. Um, but, but in terms of this proposal, obviously the ATM is set well with it, well back within the store, and there would be uh, anti-ram bollards in front of the um, ATM machine itself to prevent anyone from being able to ram raid. Uh, we've used that on another store in uh, in Cambridgeshire for, for COP, and that's worked very well. Um, but again, I think perhaps the ones that have been more of a target have been more um, perhaps close to the roadside where it's, you know, unfortunately the sort of getaway is quicker than the one here where obviously you would be fully within the site. So hopefully that, that deals with, with that point. In terms of um, noise considerations, we there is a full noise impact assessment submitted as part of the planning application um, which sets out the, the mitigation measures. Predominantly that's the use of acoustic fencing which is Noticed, uh, noted in the planning officer's report as well. Um, we're confident that the um, that, that will um, protect existing and proposed residents to be inside the development as, as, as just set out in the officer's report on uh, paragraph 25. So we feel that's been adequately assessed through, through that piece of work and those mitigation measures. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Dr. Neil Hawkins. Um, I'm still struggling to see what it is that this proposed shop can offer Comberton and Cox that is not already there. Um, I used to be the uh, district councillor for Top, so I know it very well. Um, and I'm very well aware of where that site is and the potential impact that it would have on the highway safety, especially when the school entrance is right opposite it, and I know how busy it can get, and not just in drop-off and pick-up times as well. So can you tell me exactly what it is that your store can offer that is not already being offered by the store in Toft and Combatant Stores itself? Because I use both, so I, I, know, I know what they offer. Thank you. Okay, um, so in terms of Again, I'll perhaps take those in, in reverse order in terms of the highway point first. So, um, obviously, we have accepted uh, conditions in terms of restricting deliveries, which I think is, is quoted in 
condition number 10 of the recommendation, um, which has been discussed with the highway authority. Um, so that, that's, there's, there's a range of restrictions there, which we're, we're happy to, to, to accept. Um, so hopefully that picks that point up. Uh, in terms of what it, what it can provide, obviously it's a, um, a slightly larger food store than the existing one, it, it, the existing one in, in Combaton. I appreciate the sites and topic obviously relates to Combaton, so the, the budget store. Uh, and obviously it, it will provide additional range of, of goods and um, facilities uh, and, and, certain, and, and convenience that that existing store can't provide. I think they, they certainly the, um, again, referring to the most recent consultation, there was a lot of suggestions that people are, are not using that because it hasn't got the range of, 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 of um, goods that you need. So the, um, we find that these co-op stores operate well because they provide a, a greater depth and greater range of, of, of convenience for local people to, to utilise. Uh, in terms of the, the, the top store, I mean, obviously that's some distance away from the site, and I think it's accepted in the planning officer's re report and recommendation that the the impact on that store would be would be very limited. I, again, that's um, you know has specialist South African foods um, and provides a very sort of localised need. I think the floor space for that is, is considerably smaller than the budgets or indeed the proposed co-op. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Sorry, Chair. No, it doesn't answer my question. It doesn't answer my question at all. Can I can I just ask you back to but also is it a material planning consideration what the offer is? Can we is that part of what we can look at? Uh, Chair, I think it's material to consider um, the benefit that the store could bring to a local community uh, in in that sense. So as Mr. Bra uh, Brown, Brown, I think, has said. Um, yeah, this co-op store being larger will provide a, a broader range of goods uh, and if members consider that to be um, a benefit to the community then I think that's something they can consider in their in their weighing up of the application. Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Schumacher, did you want to come back on it then? I do. Um, I mean, it, it's strange here, we're trying to, I mean, this is a proposal for a second shop in a minor rural centre. It's not even a rural centre. It's a minor rural centre, which is already served by a store. And so we're not, we're not in that. debate now, we're just having the clarification question. I'm sorry, yeah, you're right, you're yeah, right, sorry. You. I, yeah. Dr. Jefferson. That's fine, he okay. hasn't answered my question, but he's not going to answer my question anyway. Thank you. Councillor Harvey. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just, um, I, I, I couldn't find anything in the agenda pack relating to our policy CC3. Um, can you speak a bit into the microphone? It's when people are virtual. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't see anything in the agenda pack relating to CC3 and our policy um, on-site generation, but I'm just genuinely puzzled, actually, because, um, you know, uh, solar panels uh, would be the perfect marriage for um, a, a food retail outlet because of the um, power consumption by the chillers, which would be maximal um, during the summer months. So, Councillor Harvey, your question is around... The, app, the renewable yeah, so energy. I just wonder why, why, why uh, there's not more ambition on, um, you know, exceeding the minimum. So it's probably to save the, um, the client money overall. I've just had a clarification from Mr. Carter that the, our policy is for... Um, Developments that are a thousand square meters or more—is that right? Yes, through you, Chair. It's for new dwellings and new non-residential buildings of a thousand square meter or more being required to uh, reduce carbon emissions by a minimum of ten percent. So it doesn't mean that we can't ask for more. That's the, the minimum obligation. So you still, your question still stands, I think, Councillor Harvey. Mr. Brown, so it's in terms of you know, have you considered going above you know in terms of your renewable energy generation for this? Yes, thank you, Councillor. Um, so we, we have submitted a sustainability statement as part of the application, which sets out the um, the levels of energy efficiency that, that co-op look to operate within their stores, um, which is, is, is a very high level. Um, I would have thought 
perhaps this could be dealt with through a, a planning condition if that were deemed necessary in terms of just you know delving in the detail in terms of what what, what energy efficiency because obviously energy efficiency is the first principle rather than generation um perhaps we could in, include a condition that dealt with that if it were deemed appropriate but you know as i said we set out in the submission um the sort of measures that are um the, the cop achieve within their existing stores so that might provide a level of comfort thank you um councillor dr martin khan and then i have councillor oh, no. oh, no. sorry councillor dr Chiu. thank you um it's a short question um could i just ask um to what extent the business case um for this depends upon the presence of the school um because there are various references to the school um and, and the number of children who go there in our report but i would be interested to know Yes, thank you, Councillor. The, 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 the presence of the school um, is not critical to the business case. Um, obviously, the, the presence of new and existing dwellings is, is the, the, the key um, component that are set, set out in the, the submission. So um, we feel that Compton can accommodate a second school given the um, growing population, as has been referred to uh, in the, the committee report itself. Obviously, the school will generate spin off additional uh, expenditure into the store by the nature of um, its use and um, people coming and going but the, 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 the critical component is the, the presence of you know the chimney pots in terms of housing housing um, expenditure thank you thank you, um, thank you dr martin khan and then councillor heather williams <coughs> i mean two, two areas which I, I, i'm a bit concerned about uh, one is the appearance of the building, and, and secondly, is the uh, effect of on, on road traffic. Um, I'll ask a question about the uh, appearance, really. The building can hardly be described uh, as a great beauty. Uh, it's a very simple design. I realise that a, a, a store is a very basic, uh, has very basic needs in terms of a, a space and a store. But I wondered if you, what, what Consideration has been given to the uh, external experience of the uh, appearance of the building uh, uh, and its integration with uh, adjoining, not just in terms of the size, but in terms of, of, of it looking nice outside. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor. So, uh, in, in terms of the appearance of the building, I think that the CGI image earlier that was in the planning officer's presentation sort of demonstrate that the the the. the What's proposed? So obviously, we've got a, um, a, the building itself is principally brick with um, sort of timber fronting on the uh, the gable end, and then obviously the, the roofing sitting be behind that. I think we felt it was appropriate, particularly when we looked at the um, the previous planning commission on the site for the house, in terms of the design of that that building, uh, and we, we did look at the um, obviously the fairly mixed character of, of buildings in the vicinity including obviously the new development which at that time was underway at Bennell Farms now some of that's been built and obviously the um, the school buildings nearby so I, I felt we we looked principally I guess at the consented scheme um, for, for the house and tried to sort of um, replicate element components of that but as you said correctly obviously it's a uh, you know it's a shop so it doesn't want to read as a a residential dwelling principally because the, the shape that it needs to be to, to be um, operating um, sufficiently. Um, I, I wrote down traffic here, but I think that perhaps wasn't aimed at me. Um, no, no, no. The, the second part of that related to the traffic was going to be that uh, clearly that uh, children from the school will use the shop uh, and it's on the other side of the road from the school, so it involves um, children crossing the road, um, uh, particularly uh, at the start school opening, school uh, lunchtime and, and, and afternoon. What provision do you, have you thought of any provisions for in, uh, ensuring safety of, of that uh, of children crossing the road or, or minimizing risk? What, what provisions have you thought of on that? Thank you. So we, we did have some discussions uh, with uh, the school and uh, I believe with at least one of uh, both the parish councils in terms of this point um, there was discussions about potentially having some form of informal crossing um, in that location 
Um, but I think that the view was that that, that wouldn't be uh, appropriate just given the, the flow of traffic. So we were sort of led to a certain extent by that and then following discussions with the highway authority, um, we, we were content to sort of, you know, leave, effectively leave it as, as per the existing situation. Thank you. And Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I might need some clarification from officers ahead of um, the question to the, to the applicant. Um, mine's around the something that was referenced earlier in response to Councillor Dr. Stephen Hawkins' question around um, being able to look at what's offered to the Fitzwilliam um, area. But the proposal is for a food retail store, so the proposal is for this to be sort of part A. Um, class A1, I guess, for the for the land there. Um, so we're hearing a lot about the co-op, the fact, yeah, you know, we've been told about its shareholders and those sorts of things. But I mean, realistically, from offices, it could become Tesco's or it could become a, a funeral parlour or anything else within class one or class A1 or are we just are we restricting this completely to a food retail store? In which case, is the fact that it's a co-op and not a Tesco's or Budgeons or whatever else um, actually material here? Because it, and if it is, then I want to know how long co-ops are going to be there. So I might need the uh, the answer, first question answered first, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So you, the end user is not material. You're correct. So we can't control this being a co-op, albeit Mr. Brand has said that co-op are uh, signed up should permission be granted. Uh, and uh, as to the first point, I suppose um, you can consider the size of the retail unit um, here and the prospective uh, range, I suppose, that could be provided within uh, a retail unit of that size versus what's already existing in the village, which I understand to be smaller. Um, but you are correct that the end user is not material to this consideration. We wouldn't be able to control that. Chair, if I can, so what we're looking at here is giving permission for something, a building that can could actually be anything within that class A1 category. Is that correct, or can we condition? The application is for a convenience food retail store, uh, so the restriction is relevant, it's clear in my mind, albeit that's within class A1. Um, I think it's very unlikely, given the format, layout of the building, etc., that uh, an alternativeness to a retail store could end up here. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, potentially there are other uses within A1 that could potentially take the place. But I think, given the um, description of the development, it's clear that the proposal is for a food retail store. I suppose what I'm understanding from Councillor Heather Williams is a clarification as to whether they, that could change without having to apply for a change of use. The food retail store would be in use class A1, so uh, as far as a permitted change of use within use class A1 goes, potentially that could happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brand, because I understand you wouldn't ask a question of three. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Eileen Williamson. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'd like to come back to the noise question again. Um, I, I'm not convinced about... So, the, so is it a question or is it for debate about not... No, it's a question. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced about mitigation for the fans, but also I would like to know more about the noise mitigation of deliveries. Um, from experience, I know that um, at these stores, uh, a large um, HGV turns up, um, produce is removed from the HGV. It is driven across uneven land or or asphalt in rattly um, metal cages, and it is wheeled into the shop. And this could go on for quite some considerable time. And I can't understand how there will be no noise impact on the neighbours. I am very worried about those houses that are behind, that will be behind this development, both because of the fans and and the difficulty to mitigate the noise from those fans, and also the noise from deliveries where there's lots of shaky metal 
but it's Councillor really Wilson, Wilson, can so I... I'd like to know what they're going to do to mitigate that because I would like to understand how it could be possible. Can I draw members' attention to page 48 and paragraph 10 there just to see if that, the servicing plan answers your, your question there. Councillor Chris Clark would like to speak. Yes, through you, Chair. Just also to highlight that um, the noise assessment report has been considered by the Council's uh, Environmental Health Officers and subject to the recommended conditions, they're satisfied that an acceptable noise environment can be created. So um, my, my advice, advice to, to members would be uh, to consider that advice from uh, your own statutory consultee um, with respect to this application um, subject to those conditions. So what I'm seeing in, in, on page 48 there, Councillor Wilson, is that there would be no um, deliveries between those hours and there wouldn't be any servicing between 8pm and 7am on all days except for the delivery of newspaper and magazines. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, that, that's not my point. It's deliveries during the day as well, which are a disturbance to neighbours. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Would you like to come back, Mr. Brand, on any other beyond what's in the, you know, in the in the pack to, to address the concerns? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Brand. Thank you. Um, we now move to um, comments by Councillor Martin Reardon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Did I have your name correct? Sorry. Yes, it's Martin Reardon. Yes. Yeah, hello, Brian Gray, and you are the chair of the parish council. I am. Good. And do you have permission? Do you have your video, by the way? I'd like to put me on video. We can I, hear I, you. Says, we can hear you perfectly. Says, it says that I'm on video, actually. Yeah, it does. It says you're not on video anymore. Do you want to try it again? Just. It now says I'm not, and now it says I am. Did I come on at all during that process? It looks like you might be coming on. <coughs> no, but we can he we can up. hear you very, very clearly. Are you are you okay to, to just for us to hear you? Okay, that's fine. And can you're you can out. you confirm that? Not seeing me. Yeah, can we, you confirm that we you have the permission of the parish council to speak on their behalf? I, I can confirm that, yes. Good, and I think <coughs> you know the procedure that you have three minutes and we'll sort of let you know verbally after two minutes have gone that you've got one minute left. I know that, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, so good afternoon. I'm Martin Eden. I'm chair of top parish council. Um, as you're aware, competition and loss and trade aren't usually considered when deciding on an application. However, there are policies at national and local levels that you do have to consider. Paragraph 92 of the National Planning Policy Framework requires you to consider the impact of a new development on the vitality and viability of village centres. And policy E22 of your local plan requires new shops to be of a scale and appropriate to the function and size of the village. This planning application makes a case for an additional food store in the area. It says that for a food store to be sustainable, it needs a local customer base of around 1,500 people. The combined population of top and competent is about 3,000 people, which can sustain the two stores we have. Top itself only has a population of around 500 people, and so top shop is already extremely vulnerable. The application says that top residents will continue to use its local shop as the proposed shop is too far out of the village. This is undoubtedly true, but the new store will take much of the passing trade which Top Shop relies upon. And any loss of, of business is a serious loss to the village. It's disingenuous to suggest that it wouldn't have a significant impact on the trade of Top Shop. Both Top and Competent are designated as rural settlements, and so both existing stores receive a very significant business rate reduction. The loss of that for at least one of these stores would severely affect its viability. It'd be better to have two thriving stores than three struggling. In my three minutes, I cannot tell you the many benefits that Top Shop and Post Office brings to the village. It is the hub of the community. And my fear is that the current owners retire in a couple of years and they will not be able to sell the business if there is a co-op shop down the road 
and we will lose our share. The PC is also concerned about safety issues associated with the proposed location of the new store. If his entrance is off a narrow road opposite the Compton Village College, where there is already a lot of congestion at either end of the school day from parents' vehicles and the very many school buses. The council's adopted local plan has a section called Promoting Successful Communities, where it says, and I quote, many smaller villages have very few facilities, but those facilities can be important in ensuring that a basic level of service is available lo locally. The council aims to play its part in protecting and improving rural services and in order to support existing communities. And policy SC3 says that planning commission permissions will be refused for proposals which would result in the loss of village services, including village shops and post offices. This is an opportunity for the council to play its part by rejecting this application. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You Members, do you have any questions? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Newden. Thank you. Um, and I don't see that we have any local ward member who wants to speak. And so therefore, members, we move directly to the debate. Um, and I think, you know, to guide us a little bit. So we have to consider, this is about our balance. We have to consider the benefits that this additional store would bring. We're not allowed as a materials planning consideration to consider the impact of competition on other, I'd like clarification from that from you, Mr. Carter, but that's not a material consideration as I understand. So when we're talking about the loss of a service, I presume that means complete, but we're all alert to what it means to a minor rural centre as well, you know, to have the vibrancy um, of the services on, you know, on its streets and on its high streets. And I can understand what we're hearing is difference of opinion from different groups of residents about whether we should or shouldn't, you know, whether this would be beneficial or not. And it's now up to us to sort of try and find that balance. But I want to make sure that we're within the framing of what's the material planning considerations. We heard a lot about its impact on the others. So if you could help us on that, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I refer members to policy E22 of, local, of the local plan, which is, is a key consideration here. Um, in that context, competition can be material to your decision. Um, if you look uh, at the requirements of policy E22, uh, it sets out a requirement for um, retail impact assessment um, above certain, criteria, uh, certain thresholds. Uh, and point four of that policy um, comments that where those impact assessments indicate significant adverse impact on an existing town or village centre, development will be refused. Uh, the case officer may be better placed to comment on the retail impact assessment that's been submitted and what that um, tells us. Um, but in, in the context of that policy, it would be my advice that the competition in that sense can be material to your decision. Thank you very much. That helps very much. Helps me. And I don't know if the case officer wants to help us um, with a little bit more detail about the, that retail assessment. Yes, thank you, Chair. If I could just refer you to the uh, paragraph 21, where I go into the retail impact. Um, so as set out in policy 22, uh, outside um, rural centres, anything over 250 metres squares, uh, squared um, requires the retail impact assessment. Um, as I've set out, I've conducted this, I've been to the all three, or been to the two stores, the Tosh Shop and the, uh, the Budgeons. Um, and I, I feel this is an appropriate location for an additional store. Um, obviously, I've, I've quoted the 2011 census data at 2,346, but as I've stated, the village is growing with the approved residential developments, um, and it's likely to exceed this quite significantly already, um, as well as the, the location adjacent to the, to the village college. So I do think it will be serving that, uh, that purpose. Um, so the, the South Cambridgeshire District Design Guide advises that a population of circa 1,500 people is required to sustain this um, a local shop. Um, and I've said, I think the population will have increased significantly from the 2,346 in 2011. Um, and along with the Village College, I think it's competent can now sustain um, an additional store in this location. Um, 
and I've obviously gone on to assess the impact on the top shop as well, uh, which provides a very different offering to um, that the, the co-op provides. Um, and if people are travelling from Combaton to Toft, which is over 1.7 kilometres away, um, to, for sort of top-up shop, um, whether it's fruits and vegetables or um, general convenience stores, then arguably that's very unsustainable that they are travelling um, because the cycling and walking provision from, from there isn't, isn't the best. Um, and if they're driving from Combaton to the Toft shop, then uh, that's additional travels, um, travelling taking place that uh, this, the addition of this store would, would, would reduce. Um, that's something I think members should, should be taking into account as, and as I've set out in the, in the report. Um, yes, I think that's coming Thank up you, for thank you. you. And what you're highlighting is what's kind of what's in the report, so what we've, we've mm. all had before is and that retail assessment has you know, been done and you've looked at each of the individual stores and in your opinion therefore it's, you know, it's not significant enough even though you recognise that there could be some impact to warrant a refusal of, in terms of non-compliance. Um, but that's why it's in front of us here, and members, to look at the balance. I see Dr. Tina Holkins first to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, ordinarily, I would be jumping up and down and going, yay, you know, this is a, you know, a store for, uh, for a village uh, setting. But I think uh, we need to look at this on the whole. This is an existing community. Uh, yes, it will be having another 90 houses uh, added to it on the Bennell Farm um, estate or whatever you want to call it. But I don't think that that is a large enough um, addition to warrant a second store, especially when the store that is there now um, you know, is serving the community and serving it well, and the butchers, and, you know, you've got from, you've heard from both parish councils. And I hear them, and I support their views, because I know those communities. This focus shop is going to be 258 square meters, so it's, it's large. And what will happen is it will take trade away from the existing community store, which is actually in the center of the village, is more centrally located. But my view is this, this proposal is relying on trade from the school and of course the new estate, which means the existing shop will have its own trade from the school taken away from it, without a shadow of a doubt. E22-4, definitely says you know, we need to protect existing um, uh, facilities. But I will also draw your attention to policy SC, it's SC4, paragraph 5, which says the same thing. The new retail provision should not undermine the vitality and viability right, of a nearby center. It's difficult for me to say this, but I think I'm not sure this is the right place for this particular um, shop. I would love one in Caldicott. <laughs> you know, there are other villages that are growing that don't have anything. And yet, this is now a proposal for a second store in a minor rural center, which already has a store. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Martin Khan. <sighs> I find it difficult to find a sufficient argument to say that one could, uh, that, that the impact on local stores um, is sufficient to reject it. The, uh, we've already been told that the uh, local store is likely to change ownership in two years' time, uh, so the viability then will be, in any case, uh, uh, uncertain, uh, even. Um, there has been a trend been one of the interesting things but from the um, through the COVID pandemic has been that there's been a, a, a movement of tr um, trade from the larger stores down to what I call regional convenience uh, local convenience stores so this sort of store is likely to have increasing use um, 
assuming, of course, that this, uh, this change continues. One, one works on uh, the, the habits have begun to change and people are going more strictly uh, uh, centered near term. But for that to happen, you do need to have a reasonable range of product, produce in the local store for them to, to be sufficiently attractive that people don't go for longer distance. So I see a good argument in sustainability terms, in the sense that this store will be larger, will have a wider range of, uh, of, of material uh, than the other local existing stores. Uh, and so it should divert some traffic that now goes to the larger, large supermarkets to the local level. And then that seems to me something which is desirable in sustainability terms. Um, uh, and that is one of our major, major policies. Um, so, uh, the, um, to me, that seems a, a thing in favor. The thing that I am concerned about, it quite bluntly, is that it looks pretty dull. Um, and, but we don't seem to have much guidance on what small stores or, or shops should look like. Um, there doesn't seem to be any guidance. Uh, so we tend to get rather industrial building, looking buildings, uh, rather dull. Um, I think this, we're at the time of preparing for a new local plan, and these are sort of considerations which I am bearing in mind in future when, as we revise a local plan, because I would have hoped for a more inspiring uh, development. I don't think it's sufficiently um, <laughs> in, uh, intrusive in the sense that the area around it is not of any particular uh, special value, that we could perhaps uh, use that as a material consideration to refuse, unless we had a more direct policy on this issue. Thank you. But I think we could do better, uh, uh, and uh, I would like to highlight that issue, because I, I don't think I've got a, um, enough grounds for, to, that I feel that I could uh, object to this, and I, I will be voting in favour. Thank you, Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you, Jay. I'll try and be brief. Uh, I agree with everything um, Councillor Dr. Hawkins has said, so I will, I will not um, repeat those points, but I, I, I agree with, with her assessment of this application. One thing I would add that does deeply concern me is the highway safety aspect. If you put a uh, shop right off to the school, we all know what's going to happen. We're going to be crossing that road. There is, um, as far as I can tell from the papers, no safe um, crossing point. I know what the response will be, which is the highways haven't flagged this up, but I'm sorry, I just disagree with highways on this. It's common sense. Everybody knows it. Um, and that highways haven't flagged that up, I find staggering. Um, and um, I think we are more than entitled to take that into account as a material consideration. Thank you. Um, I, I completely agree. Um, I'm not always known in my household for having common sense, my husband will tell you, but on this one even I can see that's going to be a big problem. Um, children are going to want to cross that road and it's, so the location of this shop is, is of great concern. I don't think it's appropriate. And also on the basis that we, we don't know, we have to, assume that we're giving permission for the, the class, not for this co-op. Um, and I think that's a, a really important thing that we need, need to stress. So it, it could change to many other things in its, in its lifetime if it's granted permission. I'd also, just to sort of bolster and, and support the comments that have been made by Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins and, and Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, um, on without, without duplicating without duplicating it is that once <coughs> these shops are gone they are gone um, so in my entire ward I do not have a single convenience store standalone convenience store we have a very small post office and we have a farm shop that's a ward of 11 villages 8 parishes so the demand for 3 in one place I do find kind of um, surprising so and there were shops, but they couldn't survive. They couldn't thrive. There wasn't the demand and the support. So, you know, especially in these times, we have to be very careful what we're doing or we're going to be removing facilities forever. Once the top shop is shut, that will be it. Thank you. Members, um, I've heard, you know, issues around... Um, the benefits or not that this could bring the issue of impact on other um, office offers of services which are within the village and having a vibrant minor rural center issues around design issues around highway safety um, for it being opposite the school um, and again the principal development in that site and the, the, that class I have two others who are asking to speak 
and I hope they would be on different issues. So, so that they would bring more to the debate before we then move to the vote. Councillor Eileen Mason. Um, thank you. Um, uh, yes, just very quickly, um, I am concerned about the noise impacts on neighbours and also um, with the competition for other shops is the potential loss of post offices which are a lifeline for communities and when they go they're a great loss. Thank you. So I will add the environmental health issues in terms of noise impact to that. So these are things where we are the statutory consultees and consultees within our own office officers have come to an opinion, but this is what uh, uh, we are seeing as issues. And Councillor Henry Latula. Thank you, Chair. Um, at the beginning of the debate, I was leaning more towards uh, in being in favour of this application, but I must say I have been swayed quite a lot by the arguments against and the loss of other local amenity. So I'm actually a bit torn actually which way I should vote on this at the moment. Um, you know, I do sort of agree in principle to the idea of development on this area, but obviously the loss of other local business is a concern of me as someone else who represents a relatively rural area and has seen businesses uh, depleting over the years. Um, so I will have to make a choice one way or the other when we come to the vote. But one thing I did want to explore, I think you mentioned it, Chair, was a uh, condition around litter picking. Um, I think the applicant actually mentioned they would be open to that. So should we vote in favour? Um, I would like to explore adding that condition in with um, and the wording sort of put together by officers, if that would be okay, Chair. Thank you. Yes, I was going to raise then, so that's, that's very good. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, there's no reason why we couldn't uh, include an additional condi condition requiring a litter picking strategy to be signatures and agreed and then implemented um, if the committee felt it wanted to support that. Good. Thank you very much. Um, and I think you have... Michael. Sorry, three, three years, please, Chair. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Just on um, Councillor Williams' point on the use class, um, as of September 2020, the use class order changes. Um, this would fall within use class E, so we can restrict, um, we can add a condition to restrict the use of the proposed building to, um, to retail. So that would be use class E, part A. As, as stated in the September 2020 changes. Good, so I think what we'll do is we, um, I would like to, well, perhaps Councillor Williams would like to propose that as a condition if it were to be approved. Yes, Chair. So let's see if we can <clears throat> take by affirmation both of those proposals if this were to be approved. The first one would be in terms of litter picking. Can I take that by affirmation, committee? Agreed, I see that everyone's agreed. And the second one would be around restricting this to class E, as I understand. <coughs> Can we take that by affirmation? Agreed, agreed. Councillor, yes. Clarification on that, it's merely restricting it to classes, just put it within class E, surely. <coughs> Aaron, can you, Use can you, within class e. can you confirm that? Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Chair, it's, sorry. Sorry, Chair, through you, it's, it's Class E A, uh, which would restrict it to the retail element in Class E, Class E being far broader. So thank you very much, Councillor Payne. So it'd be Class E A as the condition. Um, can I take that by affirmation, everybody, including Councillor Dr. Richard Williams? Thank you. Thank you very much. I can't interpret, so I'm staring. <laughs> Avoiding my eye. Um, if there's nothing else to say, I think we should move to the vote. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and we'd now get in terms of if there were reasons for refusal. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so um, I have one reason for refusal drafted, which relates to um, impact on vitality and viability of other existing convenience stores in the village. Um, so I'll just read that one out. So the application has failed to demonstrate that Combertine can sustain an additional food retail store and that the development would not give rise to a significant adverse impact on the vitality and viability of other existing convenience stores in the village, which lie in close proximity to the site and between them provide a similar retail offering. And consequently, the proposal is contrary to policies E21 and E22 of the South Cambridgeshire Local Plan 2018. Um, we've also talked about um, highways and noise. With regard to noise, obviously you've got the comments of the Environmental Health Officer and quite a comprehensive suite of conditions recommended. Um, my advice would be that um, we should rely on those conditions to control the, the noise environment here uh, and it would be um, uh, a weak reason for refusal to, to refuse on, on that basis having regard to those comments and similarly notwithstanding um, Dr Richard Williams um, points around the highway authority and their comments um, 
it would be quite a difficult reason for this council to defend in the light of um, a no objection from the County Council High Authority, but I just wanted to say that. It's obviously up to members. What, what I would say, members, is if you are minded to refuse that one, I think that's a very substantive um, reason that's just been read out in terms of the impact on the viability of the services being offered. Um, are you happy that that's the principal reason upon which, if, if it were to be refused, that was referred? And we, what we do is we make reference to the debate we've had. Um, while, while I do agree that is a, a valid reason, I think because of the reports that have been submitted, I think while not we're on highways ground, but the location of the stall directly opposite the stall and its location is also a valid reason, the principle of, of putting the retail outlet in that particular area of tillage if we believed it was more suitable to residential rather than retail. Is that something that could be explored just on the purposes that obviously there has been documentation given on the other grounds that was given by Mr. Parkin? Through you, Chair Councillor, do you, do you mean in respect of highway safety? Do you mean its location opposite the stall, or is it? I mean in principle of development. So my advice would be, in principle, um, it would be difficult to refuse a development in principle, given we're within the settlement framework boundary, uh, and that is supported by policy. Um, that's different to the consideration of the impact that the proposal may have on other facilities within the settlement. Okay, um, so are we okay that we're taking, if, if members were minded to refuse, and that is the result of the vote, that that substantive reason in terms of the impact upon the viability of the other services in the village, um, that's the key reason for our refusal. Are we in agreement with that, members? Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Yeah, sorry. Can I just push this point about the highways? And you know, I, I will kind of defer to other members who I think are um, probably going to vote the same way as me on this. But but you know, given the, I don't want to get into a legal argument, but given the very broad definition of what material consideration actually is, it doesn't really worry me that we are boxed in by what highways have decided, um, and, and there doesn't seem to be any. You know, scope to depart from that. I mean, the material consideration is anything that relates to the use and development of the land. I think we're entitled to say that we do think putting a shop opposite the school with no safe crossing is a relevant material consideration for the use and development of the land. Um, personally, I would push that point, but I'm looking at other members who I think may vote the same way as to whether they would go along with me on that. Chair, yeah, through you. Uh, you're absolutely right, Councillor. That is a material consideration. We're perfectly entitled to refuse the application on that basis. I'm simply advising that if we end up in an appeal situation without any evidence to substantiate the point, um, then that presents it. You know, it's a more difficult uh, case to defend in, in that case, but you are absolutely entitled to refuse the application on that basis if you, if you wanted to. Right. I, I, I don't want to go around the rush on this one because I think we, we're, we, we know where we're kind of going with the vote on this. I've got that Council Dr. Heather Williams and Councillor Dr. Martin Curran. There's no reason why we can't put both reasons for refusal down, is there? Ad Carter? No, there's not. He's just saying that if, if that went to appeal, we there may be you know winning on one and not on the other. Is that it's sort of basic point. I think you've only got to win on one, Chair. Do you then, Chair? So we now have two reasons for refusal. The second, the first being one I read out, and the second um, that the Council considers there to be a significant adverse impact on highway safety as a result of the location of the proposed convenience store opposite the Compton Village College. Members? And Councillor Dr. Martin Curran. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to simply comment, ask if the proposal is approved, could we include a condition uh, to uh, have uh, some form of management um, to look? Uh, Make proposal for safe crossing, um, um, or impose a condition providing a safe crossing. What are our powers? Um, where would be? Would that be a reasonable condition? Or would? I think I'd defer to the answer that was given earlier um, by the applicant uh, that that has been explored uh, both with the parish councils and I believe the county council of highway authority, um, and uh, and has not taken any further. So I think um, it's clearly been looked at, and to to include a condition. So fundamental to, to consent, I think um, I, I wouldn't recommend that sort of thing at this point. About to move to the vote, Councillor Harvey. 
insist. <laughs> Am I allowed to clarify a point? Um, I, I just I'm a bit concerned because this really the argument is um, on numbers and the impact on public schools that um, uh, this would be a few uh, would be mitigated by future growth in the village. But is is that sort of a valid thing? I mean, shouldn't we really be deciding this on what we see currently rather than what might happen in the future? And I think that's what's been brought up in the discussions as well by Council Dr. Kimmy Hawkins and her comments. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Sorry, just come back once more. Um, so just to expand that highways reason for refusal, um, it's the lack of a safe crossing as well as its location in combination with the building. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. That's okay, Dr. Tran. Good. Members going to move to the vote now, and the, the vote is on the recommendation that this is approval subject to the recommended conditions. Um, once again, uh, which are on page 46 um, onwards. Ready to vote now, members, please. Thank you very much. Um, members, this application has been refused with eight um, votes against and two votes in favour and no abstentions. Thank you very much. Members, it's um, 20, just 25 past one and I would suggest we have a break for lunch. Um, and we have a 30-minute break. Oh, <laughs> Dr. Richard Williams. <laughs> Work that I can get back and forth to Morrison's in 15 minutes. See what evidence does. I wonder what the difference between evidence. <laughs> Thank you very much, members. So we'll have a break now and be back again, at, I would say, at two in our seats, ready to start again at 2 p.m. Thank you very much.
Afternoon, members. Um, welcome back to South Cambridge District Council Planning Committee. And we are starting with agenda item seven. This is application 20-04702 outline planning for land at the back of four and six East Drive, Highfields, Caldicott. And the proposal is for the outline planning for the erection of two dwellings with all matters reserved. The applicant, um, Johnson, and the key material considerations are principle of development, visual amenity and local character, and impact on amenities of neighboring properties with the recommendation for approval. And the application has been brought to committee because of the local parish council objection. Um, and the presenting officer is Mary Collins. Are you with us, Mary? Yes, I am chair. I'll just um, share my presentation. Thank you very much. And Mary, is this your first time with the committee? It is, yes, Chair. Welcome. Thank you. We're not, we're not cheap. Oops. Bear with me while I just get some of these settings right. Okay. So we can see that clearly, we can hear you clearly. Right, that's brilliant. Um, okay, I'll just start in that case. Um, oh, we just lost the main screen. There we are. Ah, sorry, right. Okay. Right, okay. Well, the application is situated on the eastern side of East Drive, which is on the eastern part of Highfield in Caldicott. Um, the application seeks outline permission um, for the erection of two dwellings with all matters reserved. Um, as regards the principle of development, the site lies partly within the Caldicott Village Development Framework, um, with the site lying beyond the boundary to open the countryside to the east. So this plan here shows the position of the development framework from there. Okay, so um, the existing situation is that there is um, dwellings facing onto East Drive um, with garden land to the rear here. Um, outline permission was previously refused for the demolition of number eight East Drive and for the erection of four dwellings to, on land to the rear. Um, but this current application is, um, differs from that previous refusal in that only two dwellings are now proposed and um, the land doesn't include this stretch here to the river number eight. Um, so the indicative, oops, where have I gone that to be? The indicative site layout um, shows where two dwellings could be situated to the rear of um, the dwellings fronting East Drive. Um, as you can see, the indicative position, which we won't actually be approving, but this is just to demonstrate potentially this could happen. Um, so the indicative um, position is that the factory dwellings would be within the development framework with their gardens being outside. Um, so as the dwellings are within the development framework, um, officers feel the principle of two dwellings in this location is in accordance with policy S10. Oops. Um, so the, the pattern of dwellings to the east of East Drive um, consists of low density, large detached dwellings within generous plots, um, but they're sporadic in nature and sit largely within the framework. Um, but this road does form a transition between the village and the open land to the rear. Um, 
So the two proposed tunnels were sited behind the main frontage and directly behind numbers four and six. And there, um, it's likely that their ridge line would then be orientated to be parallel with the road as the, the properties here to the front of the site. Um, so there would be quite a good deal of um, spaciousness between and back-to-back -back distances there. Um, but with this particular application, um, the, la the land within the application sites, but beyond the development framework, has actually had a change of use, uh, um, sorry, a lawful development certificate granted for um, a residential garden area. So although this is um, outside the settlement and um, development framework, it is now lawfully can be used as gardens. So um, we consider that the relationship of the dwelling with the gardens beyond the framework is, is acceptable as this land can already be lawfully used as residential garden. Um, so as regards the position, positioning of the dwelling, proposed dwellings, um, as mentioned, it's um, the layout is a reserved matter, as is the height of the proposed dwellings. So we don't know that at this stage, um, but a similar height dwelling would be considered appropriate to one matching four and six. And the condition's been added um, to sort of control that height at the reserved matter stage. Um, so in terms of its um, impact on the character of the area, um, the indicative site layout does show that there could be two dwellings um, with relatively spacious gardens and having a good relationship with the existing dwellings. Um, we would just like to just mention that there is some history of other, and forgive my sort of rudimentary <laughs> red lines on this plan, but this is just showing location of other developments in the area. So this is pretty much the application site. Um, it doesn't include that, that area of garden that I mentioned earlier, but that's approximately where the, where the dwellings would be located. This is an application at number 20, which has um, been subject to um, a refusal land appeal and is now subject to a new application that is undecided. Uh, this is land steward number 38, which gained permission. Sorry, number 30, which gained permission. And this is to the rear of number 38. So as you can see, there's the actual sighting of the dwellings here would be approximately no further into open countryside than the ones that we previously approved. Um, so just quickly going through. So this is the details of the, the one dwelling that's been to the rig number 30. This is uh, number 38. And this is the resubmitted application there. Um, so, um, yeah, sorry, just briefly talking about residential amenity. Um, we consider that the indicative um, siting of the dwelling shouldn't result in any detrimental impact through overlooking loss of light or overshadowing. And so, um, and again, these will all be looked at at the reserved matters stage when we've got more details, but we're fairly, we, we have comfort that there wouldn't be any detrimental impact on neighbors as a result of the application. So I think that's the end of my presentation. So hopefully that was clear. Thank you very much. Um, sharing. Okay. No, thank you, Mary. And we will go to the main, sort of, if you have any main questions coming um, into the debate. But I just wanted a, a clarification while you have the diagrams up there. Um, and it would be when you show, oh, you? With, with your red, where you've done the very helpful um, red lines on to show the current yeah, would you like me to share that again? Yes, please, Mary, thank you. 
That one, that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So can I just clarify that when you talked about the, the, the ones at the top, which are the two that you said had been um, given permission, were those permission on appeal? What, the planning history of, the, of those permissions? Sorry, let's just get that for you. So the one to the rear of 13th Drive, that was um, the one dwelling and that was allowed on appeal. So that's this one here, this 30. And the one at 38th East Drive um, was just an approval. Um, and the one at 20 East Drive was a refusal with an appeal dismissed. And as I said, we've got a resubmitted application at the moment, which is still under consideration. Um, Thank you very much. That's, that's good. I think it's important in terms of the planning history there. Thank you. And I saw Dr. Richard Williams to... Same question. Same question. Thank you. Good. Um, thank you very much, Mary. And we'll probably come back to you again when we get to the debate. Um, we should have with us Alan Melton. Mr. Melton, are you with us? I am indeed. Yeah. Hello, hello, how are you? And your clerk to the parish council? I am indeed. Can you see me okay? We can see you perfectly, yes, very good. Very cheery. <laughs> yes, I, I'm glad that I had other things to do while I was uh, listening to your debate earlier. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that, thank you. I don't for I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. But thank you for hanging in there, um, but that you, you were still able to be with us after after waiting for us. So that, thank, thank you very much. Can you give us um, confirmation that you've got the permission of the Parish Council to speak on their behalf? Yes, indeed, Chair. Um, I have got the permission of the Parish Council to speak here. This will be the first time I've spoken to this committee uh, as the former councillor who did it in the past has recently retired. Um, so that's why I'm now taking up the baton. Oh, good. Great to see that you're providing services as clerk with all your experience. Thank you very much. And you know that, therefore, you've got the three minutes. Yes, I do indeed. And first of all, Chairman, Chair, can I say thank you very much for extending the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm here representing the Parish Council. Uh, as you've, set, as you've set, set out, the Parish Council do object to this um, proposal. Uh, and there are a number of main reasons. First of all, uh, the Parish Council looks upon it as a blatant... Um, backland development. And I know that the officer has alluded to other applications in East Drive. Uh, some, one's been approved, one on appeal, one dismissed. And I put it to members that there's obviously no consistency and no precedent been set on those previous developments. If you take the whole site, six and four together, uh, it, does, it does really significantly overdevelop the site. But the thing that concerns members is that the garden area does sit outside the development line. Uh, obviously, that's got an, uh, a, 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 an existing use. It's had a certificate granted. It seems to me that somewhere in the past, somebody thought very carefully about it, and it's been used possibly as a lever to apply for planning permission for the proposals as set out. I would say as well on another comment, although East Road is, uh, is, is, is not a bad road, but it also has significant development around there, and it does concern members that even more traffic will be entering and egressing from a site down there. Our main concern is, is that the bulk of the proposal is outside the development envelope, and it does, in the, in the views of members, set a very dangerous precedent and represents creeping development outside the divine village boundary. And what worries members is that if this one is allowed, um, this is the thin end of, thin end of the wedge, uh, which will encourage um, further development. Now, you know, Caldicott has two very significant developments going ahead at the moment, and it is also uh, about to receive a planning application for a further significant development. And it does concern members that although these, these are only ones and twos, it does add significantly, if you add them all up over a period of time, significantly to the local infrastructure regarding highways, um, uh, junctions, roundabouts, state of the roads, and of course, educational and leisure facilities. 
So with that, uh, Chair, I, on behalf of the Parish Council, uh, our recommendation is that this is refused. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for sticking with the time. Members, do we have any questions? Yes. Councillor Fink. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so just a question in relation to the village design guide, which is what is what a year old, isn't it? Uh, that would appear to recognise, uh, as I think it says here, subdivision of large high fields plots to provide new dwellings is acceptable, subject to certain conditions which it might be argued this meets. How does your objection square with the village design guide? As far as we are concerned, it is a uh, vacant black, back land development. And quite frankly, um, the use of the uh, extended area as garden rooms, if that hadn't been there, which is unfortunate, there would have been no, uh, there would be no application in this form. Uh, as I said earlier as well, it all sets, also sets a very dangerous development, a uh, precedent for development. And it is creeping development over and above the major developments that were already taking place within the curtilage of the village. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Martin Pope. Um, you, uh, your comments about the uh, adequacy of East Road, uh, the, the, the Highways Authority uh, did not wish to object because it was a private road. Um, do you see? Um, what, how do you, can you explain the, uh, the width of the road? Is it, uh, can cars pass on it? Um, what, would the, what would the problems that you would see due to the uh, access to East Road? Well, again, it, yes, you're right. It is, it is a road that people can, uh, you can, motor vehicles can pass on. I drive down there quite regularly. Um, however, um, again, uh, if this kind of development proceeds, uh, and, and most of those properties down in, in East Road have large gardens and back onto open countryside. Again, setting a precedent, there could be a, many, many more planning applications similar to this, and, and that would increase the level of traffic movement to an unacceptable level on East Road. What you've got to remember is those who don't know the geography of it, and I didn't know until I worked there, that it is actually a cul-de-sac. And anything that goes down there has to come out exactly the same direction. So the, the traffic movements is not all one way. It is basic, basically any traffic that goes down there actually, in fact, doubles up the journey because it has to come out the same way. Thank you. And thank you very much for your time. No further questions. Thank you very much. If you can take your video off. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. Thank you. And local member, Councillor Kamalhadri, would you like to speak now? Or? Thank you, Chair. I will say my piece during the debate. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. And we move to the debate then, members. Um, anybody like to? Yes, Councillor Rabatchi. Thank you, Chair. Just a bit of clarity from the officers, please, on the um, on the village framework. Obviously, we've heard a bit about it, um, and the development as a whole does exceed the village framework albeit the, the, the buildings themselves would be within it. So I just wanted a bit of clarity on whether we can um, use that as a material reason, Chair. Through you, Chair, the, the framework boundary is a material planning consideration. The dwellings are indicative to be shown uh, within the framework boundaries, the places that are explained, but that's not fixed um, at this stage. So um, from my advice, it'd be that the framework boundary is material. Um, I think we also have Lorraine Casey, who's the area team leader for this um, part of the district on the call, and she may be able to provide some comment on um, consideration of planning inspector in relation to nearby appeal on this issue. That, that would be very helpful, because I think this issue around the backland development, and I think this is one of the reasons that also this is in front of us about this sort of whether or not this is about creeping um, development and backland development beyond the village development framework. So I think that clarity would help us hugely, Lorraine. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just really wanted to draw attention to the appeal decision relating to the dwelling that was approved at the back of number 30, which Mary showed on her presentation. Now, that appeal decision was made in 2016. The dwelling sits um, 
Although the access to the site is in the framework, the dwelling sits outside the development framework. And the inspector said that the site is located close to a number of facilities in Caldecott and is within walking distance to these. As such, whilst part of the site is classed as being within the open countryside, it is not isolated either physically or functionally from the main settlement. So on that basis, the inspector felt that the development was appropriate. Now at that state, and the main consideration was then, is it in keeping with the character of the area, which um, being a large dwelling in a spacious plot and also not extending beyond existing built form at the back of uh, the frontage development, which includes number 34 Reeves Drive, the inspector came to the view that it wouldn't harm the character of the area. The decision was also made in the context of us not being able to demonstrate a five-year housing land supply, but that wasn't um, a critical factor in the inspector's decision. So I think taking that into account, we'd caution against um, you know, any sort of resistance on the, on the basis of the village framework and suggests that the consideration should relate to the impact on the character of the area. Okay, thank you. That's all I wanted to say on, on that decision. Thank you very much. And could I um, ask that Mary, could you bring up the, the plan again that shows where the extent of this boundary, this the, the red line reaches for this particular application in relation to the others. Right, yep, just to see that. So this one here shows um, that obviously in the context of the site showing the gardens and position of the dwellings. So not, not the um, position of the dwellings, we know that's indicative, but it's the, far, the furthest, the line of it, as far as it's going, okay. So if it can we so see this is, yeah. that far so line this there. is the mm -hmm. extent of the site here. And can I issue it in so relation to the other buildings? Because I'm looking at that issue around character and appearance of the area that the other one was approved because it didn't reach further than other ones had in the area. So where does the yes. garden area on that picture? So this is the garden area that is subject to the lawful development certificate. But this proposed one is going to come to approximately there. I know, but, but, but it would be able to go right up until where? So at the moment, the indicative plan, so where the dwellings would be, but it's only indicative, would be within the settlement boundary. Yeah, and where would Sorry. The, the end of the red line boundary go? At the end of the garden, the indicative garden? So the question I'm asking, Mary, is whether or not that red line at the end of it goes beyond the, the, the yeah, other... Yeah, so this is... This, yeah, that's a bit of the... So it goes approximately there, the additional garden land. So it doesn't go beyond the other buildings at, that are further up? No. So when you look at, in comparison, you've got these workshops here. So I'm just going by that. But that's, you know, these are the workshops. Okay. So it's going to approximately there. So in terms of it, of its position, it's not actually going... Further, yeah. Okay, thank you. That was my question. Okay. Um, thank you for this question as well. Um, the uh, fear, of course, is if the permission is granted, there would be um, permitted development rights which could be expanded, ex could be uh, applied outside the development framework, uh, and the, uh, such as uh, outbuildings or an extension. Um, is it possible to withdraw the permitted? permitted development rights. You don't seem to propose to do that in commissions, and would it be reasonable? <laughs> Chair, through you, um, it's possible. I'd argue it's probably not reasonable given the existing lawful use of that land as residential garden land already. So um, that would be my, my advice. Councillor Dr. Lewis. 
Thank you. Um, can I just ask a clarification question? Go, go back to the appeal um, a, a, a minute ago. That was 2016, if I remember correctly. Obviously, our local plan didn't apply there, and then policy S7 specifically about development outside the framework wouldn't have applied at that point. Is that right? So that we are actually looking at this in a different context, the context the inspector was looking at it then. I'd have to check with Lorraine whether, whether or not the framework boundary changed between plans or not. Um, I would anticipate there was a development framework boundary in, in place at that time, but I'd have to look at the, 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 the policies you are asking. But it's the policy, and I know there was a period where, where there was no land supply. So um, I think it might fit into me if, if, if rumour is correct. Um, so therefore, we couldn't have applied the local plan. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm also asking would it have been at that point, or, or was it at a point where there was a plan in place and there was a relevant you know, policy, I suppose? Then Lorraine, did you, did you understand that question? Um, I, I did through you, Chair, yes. The, obviously, it was a different local plan that was in place at the time that appeal decision was made. Um, but it was at a time where we had a framework boundary and the, the boundary was in the, the same position as it is in the current local plan. Um, and obviously the Caldicott Village that design statement SPD has been adopted since that 2016 appeal decision. So it does represent, um, you know, a, a material consideration. But I think in one of the paragraphs of that appeal decision, what the inspector identifies as being the defining characteristics of the area and East Drive um, are replicated um, within the village design statement in terms of how it identifies the character of the high fields area and generally in general and East Drive in, in particular. So it's one of the paragraphs in that appeal decision talks about the existing arrangement of dwellings along East Drive is relatively linear. There are examples of in-depth buildings along East Drive with a large building sited on the adjacent site. Therefore, once a dwelling would introduce in-depth development, it would not result in any additional or unacceptable encroachment into the open countryside beyond the existing built form. Um, but there are a couple of points in that decision where the inspector does talk about um, the character being of um, dwellings within relatively spacious plots. I hope that answers your, your question. There was the point about whether the land supply issue was current at that point, but I, I, I would welcome clarification on that. Through you, Chair. I think Lorraine did mention that in her first answer. There, there was no five year supply at that point when the inspector didn't afford waiver for that building to be there. Yes, thank you very much, Lorraine. Um, no more, thank you, local member. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, I know this slide very well. Um, but this one is a, is a difficult one, um, which is why it's, it's come before the committee today. And in some ways, it seems to me as if perhaps, you know, looking at this with this reading, which is what we need to do from the planning viewpoint, the fact that the garden space being proposed for this is about what, two thirds of the whole plot is outside the village framework. Um, and I know for a fact that we've had a committee in the past that's turned down, you know, something that's been just over the line. And I guess we need to weigh up whether or not the use of the, um, the bed outside the village framework uh, is acceptable, which with a lofty certificate would suggest that it is. For me, the question then is putting two, uh, two potentially two buildings um, within that plot, when you look at it in comparison with the two that exists in front of it, you can see there's quite a big difference. And it's like they're trying to squeeze in too much into the space that there is. So the question then is, is there an overdevelopment there? And is it suitable? Is the character that is being created there, is it suitable? Um, my answer is no. Uh, but I take the point that has been made about the one 
that's been granted as a pill, but the inspector might not have given a lot of weight to five airline supply, but it was still within the time when we didn't have the five airline supply. I mean, I have seen this village grow, and in some ways, it's kind of been, you know, a bit of this, a bit of that, but we're now seeing a lot of uh, this sort of contribution. I guess for me, I wouldn't mind so much if all of it was within the framework, but it isn't. Um, but I know there's also other side where, the, you know, there's things being approved that have not been within the framework. I'm so, this is a tough one for me. <laughs> um, and I guess I'll be looking to the uh, other members to help with us making a decision on this one. It's, it's just, it's a tough one. I think there's too much to in that space compared to what's there already. But it doesn't mean that you can't build anything in it. And if I may ask, uh, I think with relation to East Drive itself, it is a private road. Part of it is tarred and the rest of it is not. It's a single carriageway, effectively. So it's like you have to wait and for someone else to go by before you can. Um, I know it, <laughs> know it very well. So again, you know, it's adding traffic to that, but it is a private road. Well, if I can <laughs> be my vice chair. And thank you for that, Councillor Dr. Neholton, because it's together also with the parish council um, comments. I think I find this very, very hard. But what I worry about is since the time when that was refused and then, you know, was one on appeal, we do have policies. There has been a village design guide that does allow subdivision, but it doesn't say go beyond the village development framework. So it says, yes, subdivide but it doesn't say go beyond the village development framework and the, the two thirds beyond in terms of that immunity space. Um, you know, obviously a reserve matters has to come and then they would have to show where, where the building is. So that's at the time where, you know, we would know. So th this is where I'm finding it very difficult because, you know, can, can we can come to that determination? But what, what I do find is that it, it seems to be presenting something that, on the one hand, in terms of subdivision, I also think that's quite high density in that subdivision. But two, the, that red line just seems to be continuing that backland development. I have to say that my sort of gut feeling is that's where it's, where it's sort of leading to. Um, but I'm finding it hard as an outline application to find the grounds for refusal at the moment. So I'm just, I don't know where we're going on this one. Councillor Fain. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm sorry to say, I don't find this a difficult one. <laughs> Um, it is quite clear that uh, this is residential de development up to an indicative maximum scheme size of eight dwellings that is permitted within eight villages. Um, there are precedents for similar developments on this land. The only area of uncertainty to my mind is whether we can be sure that the dwellings themselves are located within the village framework. That is the effect of the indicative layout, but that is not binding, as I understand it. And I don't think, and officers may like to correct me on this, that we're able to place any conditions on an outline consent that would make that binding. So, uh, of course, this would be a, that would be a matter for later consideration, should I? application come back for more detailed consideration. We have, as was mentioned, the village design guide, and that seems fairly specific, that the principle of subdivision of high fields plots uh, is acceptable. And whatever we may think of the merits of this, I cannot see any grounds for refusing it, given the clear guidance of the officers, the principle of two dwellings within this location is in accordance with the policy S10. Um, so for me, I'm afraid it is fairly clear cut. Thank you. Councillor in the back. Thank you, Chair. It's just a question for officers. Um, should this be granted approval today for the interest of, interest of continuity, might it be 
possible, and I don't know if it is, to condition that the reserve matters application on this site would have to come back to this committee, or yeah, it's just a question around that, just for uh, yeah, interests of of continuing the same line of thinking. Really. Chair, okay. I don't think that's something we could condition, but I think it's something I can say obviously we've heard um, and no doubt the parish council may take further into considering the subsequent reserve matters application as well. So um, I think it's something we would consider that time rather than making a condition of this application. But I can note that for the record. I mean, there are means. So the parish council objects, the local ward member objects to a reserve matter application. It would you know, come to chair's delegation, and I assume we would then make sure it came to the planning committee. So, um, yeah. Um, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I'm in the camp of struggling with this one, um, but I would welcome a bit of guidance in one point I'm struggling with, which is this point about the development framework. I mean, this is now an application, as everyone has said. Therefore, we don't know where the, 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 the dwellings will be. So we are being asked, essentially, are we happy with the principle of development here, where the dwelling may or may not be um, within, within the development framework? That, that's really all we can... Um, that's all we can do, and, and on that basis, I, I think we, we could quite legitimately say we're not happy that this is compatible with S7, because we are effectively, in principle, approving you know, development somewhere on that plot, two-thirds of it being outside the development framework. I see Mr. Carter's nodding, so, so is, my, is my analysis of that defensible? Yeah, yes. uh, I don't disagree. I think you're also considering whether or not you think the plot is capable of accommodating Two dwellings, um, as well as a, a complete separate one. Yes. Councillor Tumani Hilton. Maybe I can help. In some ways, the principle of development within that plot itself, within the framework, um, I guess is acceptable. What's not acceptable to me is that we are saying up to two. I don't think two is a good number for that. Given the character of the other plots, we're talking of single dwellings in large plots. And that, I think, is part of the, the, the difficulty I have with what's proposed. Outline for up to two. For one, maybe, but for two. Um, could you perhaps bring up the slide again, Mary, which showed the indicative plan of the two buildings? Thank you. I think members, we're going to, Councillor Heather Williams, I know that you came in a bit late so you won't be able to vote, but you are able to take part in the debate. Chairman, I was just going to apologise. I had some urgent casework which I had to attend to, but um, I won't take part in the vote. Um, if I can add to the debate, I think essentially if I was being allowed to vote, I probably wouldn't support this because those houses are going to have to put two houses and fit the character. They're going to have to be tiny, really, if you're going to not lose the um, to the point that I don't think it'd be viable. Yeah, I, I disagree that it'd be tiny, but I think I'd take Councillor Timmy Tilton's point that on that plot, and given the character and appearance of the area, they wouldn't be of the same size as the as, as the other ones. Um, members are going to take this to the vault. Um, Chris, in terms of... Yeah, thank you, Chair. Through you. So, um, notwithstanding it's an outline application, I've got one reason, reason for refusal around um, the layout uh, and the... Character. Yeah, character. Um, and that um, failing to ad adhere to the sort of linear pattern of development um, and subsequent narrow plot widths um, being out of keeping with the sort of low-density nature of the, um, the area. Uh, that's contrary to policies HQ1 and H16. Just to clarify whether or not members are looking for a second reason associated with the framework boundary or not to have the regard to Councillor Dr. Hawkins' point. In terms of principle of development or, yeah. Just stay with one or do you want to include the principle of development one?
So it includes the, I think Dr. Richard Williams also raised that, that issue, which is the Again, okay, so, so that's the second reading around the framework matter, which we can formulate the wording and agree yeah. with chair, by the chair. Yeah. Okay. Members, thank you. So we'll go to the vote, and the, the vote is around the recommendation for approval subject to conditions, which are laid out from page 61 onwards. Thank you. Sorry, I can't get that. Um, from 61 onwards. Thank you very much. So we're with, we should only have nine, not twelve members. Chair and Jeff, we, we will uh, need to vote yet. <laughs> Councillor Harvey. <laughs> He's often in another stratosphere anyway. He's usually picking up very good ideas. Um, and on that, so this is approved with five votes in favour and four against and no abstention. So thank you very much, everybody. Very interesting one, but obviously this reserved matters will come before us, I hope. <laughs> Maybe. <Once> oh, yes. <laughs> and so we are now on to agenda item eight members on page 69. This is application... 21 slash 01633 slash CL2PD in Comberton, 24 West Street, Comberton, and the proposal is for a certificate of lawfulness under section 192 for the construction of a concrete base for the siting of a caravan with an existing residential planning unit and the erection of two metre high gates and boundary fence and construction of a permeable gravel parking area. And the applicant is Mr. Alistair Funge. Um, and the key considerations is um, it appears to the local planning authority that the proposed works comply with Schedule 2, Part 1, Class F and Schedule 2, Part 2, Class A of the Town and Country Planning, General Committee of Development, Order 2015, as amended. As we know, many of the Committee of Development rights um, have been amended regularly just recently. Um, and the applicant has been brought to the committee because the applicant is a staff member of South Cam's District Council. And in so to ensure transparency, that is brought before us, the presenting officer, Charlotte Spencer. Charlotte? Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have a very brief presentation for you. Just confirm you can see this. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so it's a certificate of lawful development application for a concrete base for the siting of a caravan and the erection of two metre high gates and the construction of permeable gravel parking area. Um, just briefly outlining the site. So this is the last site here. It's number 24 West Street. It's a detached dwelling house located to the north. Um, it's set back considerably from the highway. It's adjacent to uh, the Grade 2 listed buildings here. So I'll just change my point, sorry. At numbers 14 and 18 West Street, so these two are Grade 2 listed buildings. Uh, the site lies within the Combatant Conservation Area, but it's not listed itself and permitted development rights for the property have not been removed. Uh, some just brief photos um, from Google here. So the site is properties here. This is just showing the listed buildings and how they relate to the site. And then this is just showing it from the other side. There's the property there. And again, an aerial. Okay, so this is just showing what they are proposing. So here they're proposing a concrete base for the siting of a caravan. Um, the two metre high gates are located here, which is approximately three metres away from their highway, um, with hedges along the front. And 
they're just extending the permeable gravel parking area. Um, so this is just elevations that have been submitted of the caravan. Um, however, please note they're just for information only, as a caravan slash mobile home is considered an article of movable personal property. And so there are no planning laws preventing one being kept within the curtilage of the dwelling if it is ancillary to their dwelling. So, and then, so just to sum up, um, as it's a local development certificate application, there's no material planning considerations. And it appears to the local planning authority that the proposed works comply with Schedule 2, Part 1, Class F, and Schedule 2, Part 2, Class A of the General Permitted Development Order. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, and because this didn't, well, because it's a certificate of lawfulness, there's not public consultation around that, but um, Parish Council were asked for their comments, and so we have those in the report. Um, so we'll move directly to the debate and any questions to the planning officer during that debate. Councillor Peter Fane. The chairman, just to be clear, there is, I think, no the, the, the planning merits of this are not an issue. Um, that's not relevant, nor are we in any sense being asked about the caravan, which is just a technical matter. Does it meet the terms? Does it, um, therefore, are we effectively obliged to um, grant a certificate of local development? I am, um, I find it hard to resist the comment on the paragraph 13, that the caravan would not be used as incidental to the dwelling house, and indeed the applicant has been advised that uh, that might be a matter of enforcement. I'm sure that will be well, well understood. Um, <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, it's, um, it's an open and shut case. Um, just, just for myself, so what I've understood from the comments from the Parish Council are concerns that often come to us, which is about what this may lead to. What we've got to look at is what is in front of us, and I then assume that if um, people were to see this, you know, the locality, the residents and the Parish Council were to see that this were being used not as a caravan, but as a, an additional dwelling, so that it would be a change of use, um, then that would be a matter for in, enforcement. Um, and what we would have to ensure that obviously it wouldn't be an enforcement officer enforcing upon himself, that there would be another enforcement officer that would have to be doing this. But I think that's where the main concerns are, it's perception. And that's why it's before us today. And we have to make sure that we're very, very clear about this, that it's about future use of this. And it's about concerns that what's being put in place, does this seem to say that this would be therefore used not as a, you know, a mobile home property, property but actually as something residential so um, but as councillor Fain said looking at what's in front of us I don't see any grounds for, for refusal um, councillor Dr Martin Carney I would simply comment that if were this to be a planning application I think we would have great reservations about it if we're needing planning permission it's a bit of a curious situation for instance if I wanted to put a very small bike um, bike store of one meter by one meter by two meters in my front garden, I would need planning permission, but if I, I could put a great big caravan and I couldn't. But as has been said, this is a matter of fact, and uh, the position appears to be that it is legal and uh, lawful. So that's the um, position we're faced with, and the decision seems to be clear cut. Councillor Dean. Thank you, Chair. I, I was just going to say, you know, what's in front of us, it's it's a matter of whether it's lawful or not. It, it's lawful, and I think, I think we could probably just leave it there, really. Mm -hmm. Yep, let's move to the vote. Thank you. Um, so the vote is on the recommendation by the officer um, that this is approved, the certificate of lawfulness. There we go. Okay, and um, that's been approved by 10 votes. So thank you very much. That is approved, number. And that is our last item on the agenda for today. Thank you everybody for your time.